Welcome everyone. My computer clock has just struck five. Um, I think we're going to have um, people joining even as I speak. So um, although I'll try not to go on at length, I will allow people to settle into their Zoom boxes. Um, so far we're 47, I guess, and counting. So um, welcome to all. And thank you for um, thank you for spending the next ninety minutes or however much of that you can manage to go over with us what may be the most momentous and certainly the most elaborate back to school season that I think most of us will ever know in our lifetimes. I certainly hope. Um, However, um, before we get going, um, just a couple of housekeeping notes, please. If um, I could ask everyone who is not speaking to kindly mute your microphone if you're on Zoom. And um, if you're not familiar with where that mute button is, on my screen at least, it's on the lower left-hand corner. Um, so if you're not talking, please mute. And when you do talk, please unmute. And for those of you who are joining by phone, um, star six is what I recall to be the, um, the muting uh, touch. Um, star six, is that correct, Keith? Thank you. Um, so star six mutes your phone and star six also unmutes your phone. So um, at least there is only one move to remember now, um, what I will ask all of you to do, um, all of you who wish to speak, and I hope there are many of you who do, um, we're very interested, uh, my colleagues on the board and I, um, and our superintendent, Brian Olkowski and the leadership team, to, um, to hear what you have to say, to um, hear your questions, your concerns, suggestions, anything else that you feel um, you need to share with us. Um, the way to do it, if you would please, if you're on Zoom, um, click on the participants icon, again, at the bottom of your screen, and it will show essentially a lineup of everybody who's on this, um, at this forum. So at the bottom of that column of participants, you'll see uh, an icon for raising your hand. Um, if you could please click on that in order to be recognized. Um, Zoom seems to uh, basically operate on a first come, first served basis. So um, it, will, uh, it will signal to me, uh, I trust, uh, who is basically in line. Now, um, if you've already had a chance to talk, I'm going to try to go to others before we return to someone who has already had an opportunity. Um, it's a little bit trickier with those of you who are on the telephone because there's no raise hand button on the telephone. Um, what you might do, um, what I might suggest in this case, um, sometimes if you unmute your phone, I can see it on my screen sort of highlighted. Um, and if that's the case, I'll take note and ask who it is and then recognize you in turn. Um, otherwise, if you try that and it doesn't work, um, at, at some point when there's a pause, please break in and just indicate your name and that you'd like to speak and I'll jot it down and we'll get to you. So um, anyway, after all of that uh, technical stuff, my name is Scott Thompson. I have the honor of chairing this board and there are a number of other board members who have been able to, uh, to join us for this forum that precedes our regular board meeting at 6.30. Um, and if I might just ask you um, fellow board members to, um, to introduce yourselves. Um, our vice chair, Flora. 
Hey, good afternoon. I'm Floor, and I'm the vice chair, and I live in East Montpelier. Thanks, Floor. Um, is our clerk here? Is is Jonas here? Yes. I am. I'm sorry. I don't have uh, the video on, um, but I'm making dinner. Um, uh, I'm the I'm the clerk of the board. Uh, this is my uh, my first term, my second year on the board, uh, and I'm from Worcester. Thanks, Jonas. Uh, I believe I see Chris McVeigh. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Chris McVeigh. I serve on the board uh, from the town of Middlesex, and very pleased to see the turnout today. Thank you. And and Stephen. Hi, all. Steve Look. Uh, I'm a representative from East Montpelier. Thanks. Kari? Hi, everyone. Glad you could be here. Um, I'm Kari Bradley from Callis. Thank you, Kari. Um, I, I'm not. Oh, oh Jael. Jael Polskamp from Worcester. Thanks, Jael. Um, I, I'm not seeing anybody else unless someone has. Uh, got it. Yep. It's Jill Olson from Middlesex, and I'm hi. I'm on too. I'm I'm just on the phone right now, but I'll be able to switch to video in a bit. I'm in transit. Great, great. Thank you, Jill. Um, are there any other board members that I've overlooked who are uh, able to join us at this point? Okay. Um, if not, then uh, I'd like to introduce our new superintendent, Brian Olkowski, who um, has been enduring, uh, I think, one of the most intensive baptisms by fire that anyone could, um, could think of. But um, I, he seems to be surviving it. And uh, I hope uh, we're counting on you to continue to survive it, Brian. <laughs> And I uh, just turn it over to you for um, f you and your team for a quick scene setter. And then um, uh, all of you who are here, please um, click on raise hand in order to be recognized to, um, to speak. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Um, again, I'm Brian Okowski. I am the uh, newly minted superintendent here in Washington Central Unified Union School District. I'm gonna ask Keith if he can put up the, uh, the quick PowerPoint slide presentation. Uh, we have about uh, six or seven slides that we wish, we wish to go over. Uh, and uh, as he puts them up, I can just give you a uh, brief overview. Uh, Keith, did he, did he get that? Just. Uh, Keith? Is, okay, great. So basically, if you just go back to the title page, uh, the, uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly the, about uh, the highlights of what's been going on in, uh, in our district over the last uh, several weeks. The first thing is our district has been tasked with basically doing something that no school district has, or anywhere has had to opportunity to do in our lifetimes or possibly in public education history, uh, which was basically uh, we've been given 10 weeks to prepare for reopening our schools in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, a lot of people have been working extremely hard in, uh, in trying to ensure that we have a safe return to school for our staff and our students. And that is our number one concern as superintendent. That is my number one concern. Uh, and any plan that is presented, please, I want the public to know that the, the, the key word uh, is flexibility. Uh, we have to be flexible in our approach because we have to be able to pivot at any moment uh, based on the medical science that's uh, on the ground at the time. Uh, so the story begins very briefly is uh, back in early, late June, our, task, our leadership team got together and we're able to appoint five task forces, which you'll hear about from tonight, uh, that contained over 72 teachers and administrators across the uh, district. Uh, and what they were tasked with was to look at the reopening guidance from the Agency of Education and the Center for Disease Control to determine if we could meet their guidelines in reopening schools safely and effectively and healthfully for our students. 
uh, and of course within our own local context. The uh, we were give we were uh, and, and since that time over the short summer, which seems uh, like it's flown by, we've uh, given teach opportunities for teachers to apply for leave. We've given opportunities for teachers to enroll children in our schools. Uh, the board has been very generous in uh, allowing that to happen. Uh, and we've also been working to front load professional development uh, in the uh, start of the school year so we can make sure our teachers and staff have more time in the start of the year before our children get to school in order to address uh, reopening and making sure that we have the protocols in place at the school and that staff is trained in the protocols. Uh, I can keep talking, but I'm not going to. I'm going to turn it over to our first. We have five task forces. I think we separated it into uh, several slides. Some slides, there's a one is uh, some of the task forces uh, uh, were broken apart just because there's so much to talk about. So I'll have uh, we can just move forward to our first task force and I'll have our ta the first task force chair. Uh, if you can move uh, from health task force, just talk about uh, what some of the work has been done up to date uh, regarding our health plan for reopening. Um, I, I guess that's me. I wasn't sure whether that was going to be uh, Elizabeth or not, but I guess it's me. Um, I'm Amy Molina. I'm the Director of Student Affairs at U32. Uh, our ta task force has been meeting twice a week, um, most of the summer, and we have concentrated on a couple of things. Um, mostly, it's trying to evaluate the information that we're getting from the state around how do we keep students and staff who are sick home so that we um, slow the, slow the spread or mitigate the spread um, of the virus in our schools. We've been putting in place uh, things like health screenings and temperature checks. We have um, ordered all of the supplies um, that, that not only our students would have access to if they are not able to access their own masks at home and things like that, but we've also been accessing all of the gloves, masks, hand sanitizer, cleaning supplies, all of those things that have to happen um, day, on a daily basis for our schools to reopen in the safest possible ways. Um, there's a mailing that's going to be going out in the next two to three days from each of the schools that will have four pieces of information. One will be an emphasis on updated travel information to remind people around um, planning vacations and getting ready for school. There will also be some information around the daily screening process, when to keep students home, what to do if they are ill, and then how they re can return to school when they're feeling better. There'll be some information about how parents can help to prepare their child for a return to schools that are gonna look very different um, and feel a little bit different. And then also how to wear source and wear a face mask. That's it, Brian. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, uh, if you can move on to the next slide. Facilities Task Force, is uh, Gillian there? She's here. You got to unmute? Okay. Oh, I know. So I'm a uh, good thing I'm on facilities and not technology is all I have to say with my unmuting. So facilities, like I said on the slide, we really focused on the bricks and mortar. What are the physical needs of the buildings in order to have a safe and healthy reopening? So we met weekly. We had representatives of, hang on. Oh, I have somebody who needs to be on my lap. Um, uh, from every building. And so we tackled, sort of went through the buildings and just tackled everything, evaluated and found isolation rooms and have ensured that they all have outside, direct outside air ventilation. Uh, areas of the schools that are high traffic, like offices, we have plexiglass dividers coming from Portland Glass to be installed before school openings. We uh, used a formula that allowed us to determine how many desks we can get in each room. You plug in the square footage of the room and the size of the desks and that tells you what you can do. Um, the, we had an inkling that the guidance was gonna change from six feet to three feet, but as a district, we made a commitment to not going less than five feet apart. 
uh, we ordered, uh, we have boxes and boxes and boxes of cleaning, sanitizing and disinfecting supplies. And the air handling systems have all been evaluated by Kohler and Lewis. They've been serviced and outfitted with the highest quality filters appropriate for the unit. And what that means is that in, there's a lot of talk about the MERV unit, uh, the MERV filters. Um, however, if you put one of the super fancy MERV filters in an older unit, you actually decrease the efficiency of the unit. And also all of the um, systems, operating softwares and stuff in the buildings are being fixed to have all air handling systems on maximum, um, maximum output. And then I put together a little peek inside our buildings for you, which Keith can get us to. And, and Keith, you can just switch right to the next one after that, because I'm done. All right, so that's what the insides of our buildings are looking like these days. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, task force. And this is uh, Jen, I think you're up, or is it Alicia? So I'm gonna take the lead on this one. So um, there were about 20 of us, teachers and administrators on the curriculum instruction and assessment task force. Uh, first and foremost, we vetted learning management systems and chose Canvas as the system that is gonna support our students and uh, caregivers and teachers regarding curriculum instruction, assessment and scoring. We're gonna use that same system pre-K through graduation. It was really important to us to be able to streamline our communication to families and students based on the spring feedback survey results and to ensure that we can continue to strengthen our systems of collaboration, whether we're learning in person in a hybrid model or remotely, this system is gonna support us and, um, and improve our teaching and learning across the board. We also developed the fall plan for our local comprehensive assessment plan, working in tandem with folks from the social emotional learning um, task force as well, really wanting to strike a balance between welcoming our students back to school and attending to their social emotional learning needs while also wanting to figure out where they are right now so that we can meet them where they are and continue them on their paths toward proficiency, continue supporting them. We also have spent some extensive time developing the in-service plan for the reopening of schools. So striking that balance, I think, between the social emotional learning and wellness pieces for staff and for students, health and safety protocols, and uh, learning canvas. The, um, the learning curve is going to be steep on this new learning management system for us. Balancing all of those things in addition to structuring time to reach out to families and students and to collaborate within and across our buildings. And then the final two bullets really are um, taking a close look at articulating roles and responsibilities so that we can ensure that we're meeting all of our students' needs and specifically for our students who are on individualized education plans, really wanting to make sure that we're providing some uh, up-to-date and robust guidance for our special educators as we look to um, across any setting to offer a free and appropriate public education to all of them. That's it from me. Thank you, Jen. And uh, the next slide. And uh, this uh, Steve and Casey or Keith. Yep, uh, so I'm Casey Provost, I'm the principal at Rumney in Middlesex. 
Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, the items here. So some about schedule that there's been a lot of communicated, particularly from U32. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time on transportation, food service and technology as well. Um, some notable things, and I'll try to be brief here around schedule is that a big thing for elementary schools um, is that uh, we want to reduce the number of, of contacts that, um, that kids and adults have. Uh, and one big piece of that is that um, allied arts will be in meeting in classrooms and or going outside with, with students as opposed to using classroom spaces. Um, a lot of the work of logistics does cross over into other task forces as well. So um, we were doing a bit, a lot of communication with other teams. Um, around transportation, um, we've been working with um, first student who we contract with for busing. Um, one important thing that we were able to do in the survey that we had that we sent out for families around in-person versus remote learning, we also asked if families were um, expecting to use the bus system. Um, the guidance from the AOE has encouraged to the extent that that's possible for families, that families bring students or carpool to reduce the number of students that are on buses. Um, so we are, are working on updating our bus routes and using the stops that we know that we'll need. Again, Amy mentioned this, um, health screenings ideally before, before students come onto the bus, we'll have extra masks and hand sanitizer on the bus. Hopefully students will be coming to the stops with, with masks on, but we'll have some extra supplies. Um, students will be in assigned seats when they're on the bus. Um, if, if we need to use shared seats, they would be either with siblings or students from the same pod. We've also been working with first student around disinfecting protocols on the bus. Uh, around food service, we've been focusing on uh, food prep, which our teams across the district have been doing really well since March. So we have those systems in place. Uh, we also are working on the way that students will order their meals. Um, we'll be using Infinite Campus at the elementary schools, in classrooms, and students at U32 will be using a program called NutriSlice to order their, their meals. Um, because students won't be eating in the cafeteria this year, uh, they'll be eating in classrooms. So we want to make sure that students are getting um, great meals and, and what they need that's being delivered to them. Uh, in most circumstances, it's being delivered. And I'll just cover technology quickly. Uh, a big emphasis is that we are uh, building on the one-to-one -one technology initiative that we've had. Uh, we want to make sure that all students are prepared in the event that um, our school or district or the state is, is forced to go fully remote. We want to make sure that students have the devices that they need. Um, so we've ordered tablets for students up to grade one and we'll have Chromebooks for students uh, in grades two through 12. Thank you, Casey. And is this Lisa or Kat? I can start us out, um, though um, I do want to just mention since she's here tonight, um, as you saw at the last board meeting, the, there was a real um, emphasis on focusing on the social emotional learning work that our group has been doing and Lisa has been facilitating that right along the way with me. Um, so I won't go into this as deeply as I did the last time. One thing that I think it's really important for us to note is that we've been working on social emotional in Washington Central for many years um, and we are committed to, um, we are really committed to health and wellness. Um, the task force has been able to leverage that work that we've been doing over the last few years to adapt to the more urgent needs of this time that we find ourselves in. I saw that um, reflected beautifully this morning in um, the last task force meeting with our group um, as we were planning and going over the final touches for professional development in, in service for returning staff this year. It was a, a true reflection of uh, responsive classroom, which is something that we use in our elementary schools, the TA system that we use at U32, restorative practices, and the trauma-informed approaches. All of that coming together in some culminating activities that I think can really uh, see us through um, the, the reopening of schools safely. Lisa, is there anything you want to add? It's okay if you don't want to. All good. Nice job. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Next slide. And uh, we'll have uh, Aaron, Are you, is Aaron? I'm here. All right, great. Yep. Thank you, Brian. 
So I'm Aaron Boyne, the principal at Berlin Elementary and uh, facilitated the funding policy and communication task force. And we only really focused on communication uh, during the summer. Um, obviously a very important piece to this whole puzzle. We first looked at ensuring that we had some structures to how information was collected and distributed. Uh, we wanted to make sure if there's anything that I could say about this, that we were all on the same page with the appropriate and, and, and accurate um, information and the timing of that getting out to uh, families and, and staff. Um, we wanted to make sure there weren't any mixed messages. We wanted to make sure that uh, um, you know, everything that's coming at us out there in the world with, with, with news and, and, and media um, articles, there's all kinds of things happening. We wanted to make sure that we were careful and accurate with when we were sending things out. Um, so that was a big part of, of what we were ensuring. We created structures to uh, know when things were going to be distributed. Um, as you've been seeing, uh, Superintendent Brian has been uh, putting out newsletters on Fridays and the building principals have been following up with families and staff early the following week. Um, we made sure that we had structures for each task force to be communicating with each other during our leadership meetings. Um, and another big piece of what we worked on was the website. So linked to each school webpage and the district webpage is a COVID uh, webpage. Um, We've been very careful to make sure that information going in onto the webpage has been appropriate and accurate and relevant. Um, so make sure that you check that webpage out because a lot of work's been put into that. And uh, I just want to give credit to everybody on my task force that took time even outside of meeting time to get that webpage going and keeping it up to date. Um, so that's been that's been our focus as we move towards the opening of school. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, and I just want to also uh, say that uh, at last uh, board meeting, we had a Q&A uh, uh, section. And what we've also added now onto that website as a result of the board of uh, school board's uh, Q&A was adding a frequently asked questions page to that uh, website, which we update from time to time as we get more information uh, around some of the most frequently asked questions that we're receiving from members of the community, parents, teachers, and staff. Uh, and I think uh, that is our presentation. I can turn it over back to you, uh, Scott, and uh, we'll be more than happy to field uh, questions. Thank you very much, Brian. I think uh, as you can see, uh, this has been a colossal effort undertaken over the summer um, and from before the summer to prepare for this um, for the school reopening, which is like um, none other that we've seen. Um, given what you've what you've seen and heard just now, uh, I invite you, members of the public, to um, to click on the raise hand button on your participants column. Um, just to, to let us know what questions you might have, um, or you don't have to have questions, you can have comments. Uh, we really feel that we, the board and the, uh, the employees of the school district, the leadership of the school district need to hear what is on your minds so that, um, so that we don't overlook anything and so that we can uh, continue to develop the plans and execute the plans as best we can. And, and I see, um, Caroline, is, is that you? Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to comment because I had a meeting this week um, specific to my kids and their re-entry to school. And I just wanted to say both the written information that's come out, the plans that are in place, um, it feels really good as a parent to know that everything has been looked at and discussed. And um, I just, I really feel like the district's done an amazing job. And I know 
it took a lot of work. So from a parent perspective, I just want to say thank you so much because it is really hard and it just means a lot. So thanks. That's great. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I, I know that's very much appreciated all around. Um, Chris and Ursula or Chris or Ursula? Yep, thank you. So I, this is Chris. In the presentation, you'd mentioned the five foot desk spacing and that that was based on a recommend or an allowance for as close as three feet. As early, as recent as this afternoon, everything we're seeing on the CDC as well as Vermont Health, Vermont Department of Health still says six feet. So can you tell us where that three feet is coming from? Sure. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you for that question. So the, uh, they just recently literally updated that guidance uh, within the last few days. Uh, so maybe they haven't posted it, but we have received the guidance. I know that uh, uh, I was just recently speaking to other superintendents around the state who are doing more of a hybrid model because they couldn't do a uh, six feet model because they don't have the space in their buildings. Unlike us where we do have the space, we've been very fortunate to do that. Uh, they're now look, re-looking at their plans at some of their elementary schools to see if they can actually get more children into the building uh, and see what's possible. Uh, so they're, they're, uh, I know that's been happening. So I can't speak to why that's not listed on the website that uh, you're looking at, but I know we've received that guidance um, and, and maybe they just updated it. At, I don't, I, I've seen it. I saw more updates about it as well. Uh, today, but it's been, I believe it's been updated. It may be on their frequently asked questions page. Okay, so then can I ask a follow on question? Yes. When you're considering close contact for the greater than 15 minutes, you're using the three foot or the six foot? Yeah, so I, I, I think that we're trying to always go for the six foot with uh, where feasible and when practical. That's what the that's what we're trying to do because uh, we, if we can do that, that's always preferable. There may be times where you know children may have to be uh, you know five feet, four feet, but uh, we're really trying to keep that uh, at six feet at most times. I don't yeah, know if that's, uh, that's understandable. And that's where I get the, the definition of the close contact is less than six feet for a cumulative period of fifteen minutes. So that's why we're trying to understand if they're three feet apart for five minutes here and 10 minutes later or whatever it is, how, what the definition is that's being used and how it's being tracked. Yep. Brian, could I speak? Sure, absolutely. Hi, Chris, this is Amy. Um, so I actually have the AOE guidance pulled up right in front of me. Um, and so if I could just read it for everybody to hear, it would be great. Um, adults and adult staff within schools should maintain a distance of six feet from one for another adult as much as possible. Teachers and staff should maintain a distance of six feet from students as much as possible. However, brief periods of closer contact, such as when a student may need one-on-one -on -one guidance, clarification, or assistance is expected and permitted. In these cases, staff should consider standing, kneeling, or sitting side-by-side -side student students rather than face-to-face -face for brief amounts of time of less than 15 minutes. Younger students pre-K through grade five should be spaced at least three feet apart. And to the extent possible, older students grade six and up should be spaced six feet apart. <clears throat> um, when physical distancing is not possible, it's even more important for students and staff to adhere to the facial covering requirement. And so I can speak directly to U32. That's the guidance that we are um, I'm planning on following. Like Thanks, that. Amy. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, others, um, and if if other, uh, Robin. Hi, this is Robin Gannon. Uh, my daughter Jennifer couldn't attend, and she wanted me to ask a question for her. She has two children. If one of her children is sick, is she's supposed to keep both of the children sick, both of the children home, even if only one has symptoms? 
Uh, thank you. I'm going to turn that one over to our COVID-19 coordinator. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's evolving always. But if a child is sick in your home and without, you know, any... The um, thing is that anything can be a COVID sim symptom and that's what we're trying to deal with and make sure everybody's safe. But if, if for instance, a, um, a child goes home sick, the, their sibling does not have to go home. The only, the only reason there'd be that happen is if there had been some exposure to a positive COVID case or that child becomes, you know, it does get a test and is tested positive for COVID, then yes, then that would happen. The child would be quarantined with the family. But just for the regular, ordinary, you know, I have a headache, a stomach ache, those kinds of things to send home, or even a fever. You don't send the whole, the whole family doesn't have to be there. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Um, David Lawrence. Yeah, uh, just directly on that particular, I have a bunch of other questions too, but specifically on that one, the FAQ does have a link uh, to the state website about it answering the question if a student is ill and other parents, um, oh, that's a separate, I'm reading the wrong one. Uh, what do we do if a family member is diagnosed with COVID-19? Do we all quarantine? And it's and it suggests you click through. It would be useful if you actually put the summary of the um, Department of Health's recommendation in this. It says, uh, essentially, if you live together, that you should all quarantine for two weeks. And then you could provide more details by the link. <laughs> Elizabeth, did you have anything, any response to that? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. If, if, a, if, a, if any family member has been diagnosed with COVID, the entire family will be quarantined. And the, the Department of Health will do the contact tracing and figure out anything further beyond the family. But yes, if somebody in the family, then the family will quarantine for 14 days. There's some specific like 10 days, if this or that, but that's, that's there, and I think I think we send home information. I think the um, information we're sending home does have that in there. If if it's COVID positive, versus um, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I don't see anyone uh, on Zoom with a hand. Uh, uh, well, unless David, you uh, you mentioned that you had other questions. Um, uh, sure, I'll go again if I can. Uh, I can't tell if Keith's about to speak though. Great, you may go and then and then Monica um, to follow. Okay, well first just kind of a general question here about what is the preferred address for sending feedback for like things we identify on like the FAQ that maybe could be a little bit more filled in? Uh, do you have, Brian you're muted if you're trying to answer. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the question. Can you repeat it one more time? Um, so there are a number of things I noticed in the FAQ that I thought could be filled out a little bit better or a little clearer. Where would you like that feedback sent about the um, about the page? You, uh, you could send it to the COVID, the contact us on the website. That would be helpful. Or you can send it directly to me either way. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, one of the things that I'm no. Uh, oh, I had one a uh, very specific question about um, WCUSP right now, which is, uh, do you have any uh, percentages now, rough estimates of how many students you're expecting to be in person versus remote? Uh, as of right now, uh, and, and of course this could always change and that's why we have to be uh, uh, ready for anything. Uh, as of right now, we had a, uh, according to our elementary our, our elementary remote surveys, we have 78 children uh, in the district uh, that will be uh, enrolling in a remote only option. So as of right now, everyone else is, uh, we plan for them to return to school. Right, so, the, and that's 78 out of a district population of? Uh, at, the, at the elementary level, I don't have the exact numbers with me, but uh, 78 probably, uh, 78, uh, we have about six, did someone interrupt or did someone actually have the numbers? Or, no, I think I heard some, <laughs> oh, Sorry, maybe it's my daughter who just came over, but uh, it's, so what uh, it's, uh, 
we have about 16, between 16 and 1700 children in our district, about 750, give or take, go to, go to the uh, high school. So uh, uh, a majority of our students are gonna be going back to school full time. Right, so we're looking at around one in 10 that opted for remote only. Around that time, around there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to uh, also observe that you know, having our date pushed back to the 8th is a bit of a boon because we get to see what's going on in other districts as they reopen around the country. And I recognize that not only is Vermont different from, say, North Carolina, but, you know, certainly Washington County is going to be different from Chittenden County. Mm -hmm. But in that light, it's hard to ignore that yesterday UNC reported they had to close because their case rate quintupled from one in 50 to almost one in eight, over one in eight. Um, and that, you know, significantly exceeded the guidelines from the WHO. I'm wondering, have we established thresholds for, you know, okay, that's it, got to pull the breakers, everybody out. Yes. So uh, that's a great question. I've asked that question uh, myself. Uh, I will. What I can tell you is uh, the answers I received from directly from the Secretary of Education regarding that question is uh, we're looking at the science. The district, uh, the uh, state of uh, Vermont, is looking at the science on the ground, uh, and right now that it, they're saying that it supports a reopening of school. Uh, a full reopening is what they're they're really hoping everyone ultimately moves towards based on the uh, metrics of transmission rate, number of hospital beds being used, number of hospital beds being available, uh, the number of cases that are being identified in our area. Uh, the other thing that they're looking at is instead of looking at places like you know, you know, North Carolina and other places around the country, uh, they're really paying attention to what's happening in Vermont with the, chill, with the uh, college students coming back into uh, colleges because the college students in Vermont have uh, begun returning to their uh, campuses. So uh, they're definitely looking at that. They think that might be a better indicator of what we may expect than rather looking at other colleges around the country that have different metrics on scientific metrics on the ground. Um, they, uh, as for a threshold, I've asked for that. The, uh, the folks at the Department of Health have not provided us with a threshold. I don't think, I think they do not want to be uh, um, uh, stuck in a situation where they say a certain number and, uh, and then so they have not been able to give me give us a threshold uh, and so that, that's where we're currently at they did say that uh, uh, they believe currently that the data in Vermont looks so promising that uh, if you look at the, the guidance uh, that's been posted step one step two and step three they want all schools to open up in step two with precautions in place uh, they're, they're actually having conversations. This is as of last week with my meeting with the secretary that they're thinking that there may be a time coming up in the next few weeks that they want us to hold off and wait to moving us into step three, which would be because the data is so promising uh, that it supports a full reopening of school. Uh, not, not, but they also said that because the, due to the highly, uh, the high, highly contagious nature of this disease, um, we have to be prepared to even pivot to step one. I mean, there could be a situation where we, uh, we are opening in step two, which is basically the precautions and guidance that we talked about that we are implementing with full fidelity in our district, which the leadership team and our teachers have been uh, grappling with for the last uh, 10 weeks uh, of the summer. Uh, we may have to actually have a point where we're gonna have to, uh, we may move up to step three in a, in a month, and then we may have to be ready to pivot back to step one, which is a, co a total uh, uh, close, closing of all schools based on whatever happens on the ground. So, and I think that's what our plan is. We're, we built a lot of flexibility into that plan because uh, we have to uh, make sure we are being extremely safe for our students and our teachers and staff. Great, thank you. And then I did have just two more really quick um, things. Like, David, it, it, may, I, may oh. we come back to you? Um, because others have, uh, have been inspired by your example and have um, would like to put their questions as well. But um, please put your hand back up and and um, we'll we'll return to you. Um, but I have Monica and then Lisa Hanna. Oh hi, thank you so much. Um, I was curious about the recommendations for the masks. I mean, from what I've read, you're supposed to wash them every day. And so if we have children, it says maybe you should use two or three a day. 
like how will something like that be recommended or enforced or uh, maybe I haven't read enough about what we're doing currently to understand how that would work out. Thank you very much. The uh, the very famous mask question. We uh, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. I'm going to turn that over to Elizabeth uh, to talk about the masks, and uh, uh, I know she's been working on that uh, question for quite some time. <laughs> right. I mean, I think one of the one of the best um, mitigating factors to this disease is wearing a facial covering and a mask. So we're I mean, I think that, you know, we're going to do, people will need to do the best they can. It's we, we did in the letter that we sent out, we had, it suggested that people have 12 to 15 masks so that you don't have to wash them every day. You can wash them once a week. And sometimes you can just leave them in the sun too, or in a bag for a couple of days. And that's, that's also okay. Of course, children, you know, sometimes they'd be soil. They should really be washed depending on what's going on in there. And um, so we will have, we're, we're hoping for that. Everybody's maybe not going to be able to do that. So we have a, we have extras. We've done a, a huge um, call out for people to um, make masks. So that we'll have extras in the in the school for students. We'll have extras on the bus if a kid doesn't gets on the bus and doesn't have their mask that day. They'll be handed one because we want to encourage it as much as possible. And there'll be a lot of education. There's a lot of games you can play. There's a lot of, lot of social stories that help children to understand. And the modeling will really help them as well. You know, I know that the, the um, information we've gotten from the summer programs and from the um, daycares is that children adapt and they get into it and they're not. it's not an onerous thing for kids. And I think that that's, it's just one of those things, washing your hands, wearing masks, um, staying a certain amount of distance is so important. So we're gonna work at it and it, it's, it's a work in progress, I guess, you know? Oh, totally. And I think like my biggest concern or question is like, oh my gosh, if you're looking at something where we did have a big outbreak, um, is it reasonable that parents are going to actually follow through with that? Or would it be like a medical office where you had the paper masks at the door and you would assure that every kid had a clean mask? I don't know, really, I don't know any of the statistics on you know, what a difference that would make, but I was just curious to ask the question. Mm -hmm. We will definitely be aware of children who don't have a mask and we will offer them one. You know, there, there will be a supply available to them. It has to happen. And let me just piggyback off of that one. Uh, and, uh, we all, and we will also start looking into why the child is not wearing the mask. Uh, is it a medical issue? Is it a social emotional type of thing? Or is the child just refusing to wear a mask? Uh, and at that, and we, as superintendent, I'll be prepared to uh, make uh, the hard decisions to support the principals in those buildings. If a child does not wear a mask and it, there's not a medical reason, or there is not a uh, social emotional type of reason that may be related to an IEP or a 504 type of accommodation, uh, and it's just plain refusal, well, that's why we have a remote option. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa Hanna and then Nadzam, if I'm, spell if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thank you so much. I just have a clarifying question for a little more detail around um, health screenings um, and just the importance that we're hearing at the state and district level about staying home when sick. Um, I'm looking at the FAQ right here in front of me and you know, just the ask of students and teachers to stay home if they are experiencing any of the symptoms and asking that students and staff not return until they're no longer considered contagious. Um, so it's my assumption then, and you know, I guess I'm just asking for a correction if I'm incorrect, but family should be, if a, if a student or a teacher has a cough and a runny nose, um, and maybe is not necessarily advised to take a COVID test, but they have those symptoms that could be associated with COVID, that if that cough and runny nose persists, you know, as we know, especially for kids, they can persist for four, five, six, seven days. Um, you know, the am I correct to assume that families should be prepared and teachers should be prepared to stay home for the duration of all symptoms? Uh, 
I'll turn that one over to uh, our COVID-19 coordinator. I, th I thought I was unmuted. Th that's correct, you know, and, and this is a, it's a, it's a pandemic, you know, so we have to do everything in our power to, to keep all the kids and staff safe. And so it will be different this year, you know, children who ordinarily could come and have some water, take a rest and then go back to class. That's not so much going to be what's going to happen. You know, we're going to have to err on the side of caution and send children home. The algorithms from the state are still being produced as far as how many days and what kind of symptoms you need to have. If, if you have more than one, if you have like a cough and a fever, you definitely need to get in touch with your medical provider. And they're prepared too. They've been meeting also all summer long, all the pediatricians and the healthcare professionals have been meeting to try and figure out the influx of people are gonna be calling them for advice and to be seen or not seen. Testing is possible, but it's not that available right now, you know, for, and, and so, we will be erring on the side of caution. Parent, parents should be prepared for children to be home more than usual. That's true. Um, and there will be clearer guidelines for specifically how long, um, you know, and they would need to be symptom-free before they came back, yes. Thank you. Um, Nadzam, and then I have a question that was related to me through the chat box. Hi, my name is Kevin Adzum. I have a child at uh, East Montpelier Elementary. Um, first off, I do want to say thanks to everybody. Um, your efforts are tremendously appreciated. And even though we're not always at the board meetings, uh, we're reading everything and, and appreciate the communication from Brian and, and the work that everybody's putting in. Um, so through the app, we're going to be sharing really a lot of medical information with the schools so that you guys can make intelligent decisions about what stage to be in and what to open and, and, and what to do. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm in the same boat. Our family needs to make decisions about what's right for us. I'm wondering what information is going to be shared back with the community. And I don't, I don't mean identifying information. I certainly uh, respect all of the legal requirements. I understand that, but also respect people's privacy. I'm wondering specifically about things like the number of new cases in a school or the number of new cases in a pod. So that if, as parents, we were aware that the number of new cases was rising, even though the school might judge that it's appropriate to stay open and to follow those guidelines, we as a family could make an informed decision about whether we wanted to keep our child home for a couple of days, what information will be coming back our way so that we can make smart choices too. So uh, I can tell you uh, that's a, that is a great question. Uh, I know that's a question I've also asked at the uh, at, to the state level. Uh, they've uh, they they are I think struggling to answer that question because um, the moment you a district or school sends out a notification that there's a a, a a case in the building because we're such a small local community. You know, kids come home and they say, was, who was out today? You know, who was absent? And so we have to be careful. It's a fine line between public's right to know and uh, HIPAA, uh, privacy laws that protect uh, individual uh, folks. And so I think th that the state is still trying to answer that question. Um, and they have they have said, uh, you know, we will have to probably lo also look into our legal guidance uh, with that thing, with that uh, answer, to give you a better answer. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have any other information? Yeah, well, you know, what would happen if a, if a child got sent home and um, had a positive COVID test, and so they're quarantined and all, immediately what's gonna happen, most likely, according to the state, is that the, the um, Department of Health will contact the school, and most likely that classroom will be closed for 24 hours at least, while they do the contact tracing. So, um, and then based on the contact tracing, you know, they, they may indeed say that there's not, it, depending on how much that, that child has maintained distance, worn masks, didn't have a lot of other contacts, they may not need to, to close anything further. They might, might decide that, but if indeed they, they do, then 
from that would be our decision about what to say, you know, what to say. But I think immediately you would know if, if your child was in a classroom where there had been a positive case, you you would have you would know that because your child would be home and we would pass that information along. On a it's really important information everybody wants to know, you know, because I, I would feel the same way. I would just want to have the information and then I can make my own decision, you know, and um, and I do think that parents have a right to know information in a general way. If you've noticed at the state level, when they do, when they say there's been an outbreak here and they're so cautious about giving any specific information and a school is, you know, but we have little children in school and I know everybody's concerned. And, um, and I think we will come out with really much clearer information about exactly what you will be told when so that you have that information, you know, in advance. We just haven't figured it all out quite yet, but. And hopefully we're planning that there won't be, you know, cases right now with the state, well, I know, but, you know, in the state of Vermont, we're really in a good place, you know, and if you look at, we could compare ourselves to other countries who've gone back to school. We have, I'm listening in tomorrow with a, a nurse from Switzerland who had, I heard from her months ago they came, went back to school and they've had a great experience, you know, and they haven't had outbreaks, but it's it's what's the, in the surrounding community, which right now is fine and you're right, you know, we're close to a lot of other states that don't have such good statistics, but we'll do our best to keep it that way. Thank you very much. Um, I, have, uh, I have another name that I can mangle here, my apologies. Um, followed by Honeybean Barrett. So um, this question is from Emma or Emma. Uh, sorry, I have no mic. Here is my question, which is very similar to the one that was just asked. Are teachers being tested prior to students coming back? Is there a way to test all students a week before school starts since the start date was pushed back? Um, and then follow up, what is the notification protocol? if there is a positive case, which you've just been discussing. So, so I think uh, I, I also asked this question uh, directly to our secretary. Uh, and uh, the answer was due to the contagious nature of the virus, there will be no testing uh, that's gonna be required of staff or teachers or students because you could test one day and then next, next day, if someone is infected, it wouldn't, it, 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 it wouldn't have mattered. That's why it's so important to, when we reopen schools to have these precautions in place uh, to protect people. Uh, so there's, no, there's not gonna be testing, uh, uh, mandatory or required testing of teachers or staff or students to come back into the building. Uh, and uh, in regards to the other question, I think Elizabeth just answered it. Yes, thank you very much. So, um, Honeybean Barrett, followed by Jane Coffey. Hi, thanks, Scott. I am appreciative that we got some guidance today about what fall sports will look like at the elementary level. And I'm wondering when we will receive information about middle school fall sports. Um, particularly interested in knowing if we are traveling to other towns in our state and if we will be relying on buses to get our players there. So I'm going to turn that one over to uh, the high school uh, principal. Or, uh, about, have you heard anything about high school sports? Yeah. Yes. So um, we've received all that same guidance, and we're still working out the details for what our sports season is going to look like uh, for both high school and middle school. So um, I, I wish I could give a more detailed answer than that, but we're just it, it's pretty complicated right now. But we're we should have a plan out in the next uh, few days. Thanks, Stephen. You're welcome. Great. Um, thank you very much. So um, Jane Coffey, followed by Jill Drury, please. Hello. I was just wondering if the hours of the day are changing. I noticed Montpelier was getting out at 1.30, so I was just curious if it's still 8 to 2.30 and 9 to 3.30. Yeah, the, yes, uh, the plan right now is to uh, have a full day of school for our uh, students uh, in the full in five days a week. Thank you, Amy? Brian. Brian, could I add one thing though? We yeah, sure, have, absolutely. We normally have early release days on Wednesday, um, where we get out at two o five, and um, I think it's three o five at the elementary school. So that 
that is traditional and that will continue on Wednesdays. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. Um, so, Jill Drury, followed by Carol. Uh, yes, my question um, kind of stems from one of the last school board meetings about how you guys were partaking precautions around um, active shooters and making sure that um, central office was safe from your active shooters. Um, most of the elementary schools in our district are going to be do utilizing outdoor classrooms more. Um, how are we going to be taking precautions around active shooters when our kids will be outside for longer periods of time? Uh, so, so ultimately, uh, during active shooters, uh, we have to definitely, we recently got guidance from the uh, state regarding uh, fire drills, uh, lockdown drills, all those types of uh, crisis situations. So uh, we're, we're working to incorporate that in our plans. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't know if I have any elementary principals in particular. I know our elementary principals are, have been working to try to get our children out outside. Uh, does anyone have any uh, information regarding uh, what, what, what we're, what we're going to be doing with active shooters uh, uh, if, God forbid, that ever happened? I see Gillian has her hand raised. So I, I don't have a ton of really specific information, but I know that through VSBIT and the, um, oh golly, I cannot remember, the Vermont School Safety Initiative or, or whatever, they recently had a webinar and are putting out some information um, about that. I think that one of the things that's sort of challenging about the whole thing is figuring out, you know, what is the actual sort of more real and imminent risk. And that you see, so it's a constant balancing act in terms of thinking, you know, the, we know that the extended periods of time inside and, the, and all that stuff is the higher risk for the COVID to then you go outside. But I, you know, um, there's stuff about, you know, walkie talkies and, yeah escape stuff and all that, but it, it's honestly, that's something that's been evolving and we're watching it. Yeah, yeah. I, I can just add in that usually, uh, uh, you know, not just active shooters, but maybe you have a bear outside or, or some kind of animal uh, outside. Uh, and so I know a lot of schools use walkie talkies uh, and can phone in uh, to, to try to let people know that they're safe or there's something happening. I know those are some of the things uh, I know, uh, Teachers do. Teachers and staff also have cell phones on them and other ways of communicating. However, I do rec also recognize that not all not all cell recept not everyone gets cell reception in certain parts of the, uh, the outside of school buildings or even sometimes in school buildings. So I think uh, you know the uh, walkie talkies I know has been a very effective uh, way of helping to address at least alert people to things that are happening outside. If I could just follow up, I'm just, the reason why is I've talked to several schools that are kind of bordering our towns. Um, and I know these schools of when, you know, parents asked about outside classrooms, the teachers and the principals have all said that in reality, they didn't want their kids outside for longer periods of time. Um, you know, going outside for shorter mass breaks, going outside for, you know, extended recess or a picnic outside was fine, but they thought that the kids could be sitting ducks outside, not only for active shooters, but in reality, some of our kids could, you know, take off. And then to be honest, it's hard to keep track of all these kids. And that was a lot of concerns from some principals at other schools bordering, mm -hmm. you know, these towns. So I kind of wanted to see what our school system felt about that. Yeah. And I think you made a very good point. I think, uh, you know, we're always, it's always a balancing act, right? Uh, trying to get kids outside because we know that uh, being outside uh, is better than being inside, especially during the pandemic. Uh, but also that when you go outside, there is a trade-off, right? There's, a, there's animals, there's other things that could happen. Kids could run off. And those are the types of things where uh, you know, teachers and are working with their principals uh, and making sure that the kids are safe having opportunities to go outside, but we wouldn't want them to go outside and be and jeopardize the safety of their, of children uh, in any way. Thank you. Um, so Carol, followed by Lisa W.
Carol, if you can unmute, if you're there. It should be working. Except that we can't hear you. Um, I have a suggestion, Carol. Perhaps if you were to um, to follow Ima, Emma's example and send a chat to Keith McMartin and then I can read your question um, for you. Um, and then we can go to uh, Lisa W followed by, oh dear, I'm just a total failure at the pronunciation B of names. Um, uh, I'll need some help. Um, last name Young, Young, Spunchy Young. Anyway. Um, Spunky. Lisa, Spunky, aha, thank you very much. So Lisa W first and then Spunky second. Thank you. Hello, I just have a question that um, I came up when we were talking about masks. Wondering is there a protocol or a need for a protocol for what the children do with their dirty masks? Where do they keep them and how do they keep them? Um, just so that, you know, I don't know if it's okay for them to just be thrown in their backpack or if there should be a Protocol. Yeah, I'm going to uh, let Elizabeth answer that one. I think, but I, I think I understood what you said. Um, so each each um, school is actually doing their own kind of protocol about exactly what they're going to use and how how children are going to keep the masks attached to them and not floating around or ending up somewhere else. But each child should have two bags, whether it's a plastic bag and a, you, know, you just label their name and the dirty ones go in that. If they're dirty, they can just go in the bag and go in the backpack and, and be sent home. And then the clean ones are in a separate bag. They can just pull one out. I mean, that's the general idea, you know. Um, is that, is that the answer? Does that answer your question? Yeah. The logistics of it might be a little bit different in different spaces, different schools. Right. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, Spunky Young, um, followed by Erica Zimmerman. Hi. Um, I was thinking that there's probably going to be higher than average absenteeism for these students and for potentially longer periods of time. What is it going to look like for the kids to keep up with their assignments? I know we keep hearing about this Canvas platform. But what, what does that look like for, if, say, they're home for a week at a time um, with, with a small cold or a cough, and we don't want to send them to school? Um, how do they keep up with their classwork? I'm going to turn that one over, over to either Jen or Alicia. I can start, and then Alicia, pipe in if you'd like. Yeah, that is one reason why going to a learning management system is going to be so important for us so that we have some more flexibility around continuing to support students learning. As we are rolling out our plan for uh, getting our teachers and, and paraeducators uh, used to using Canvas and creating lessons in Canvas, we're also going to do a similar rollout for the beginning of the year for our students so that should we need to pivot, um, they have some experience and we're also designing um, sort of a checklist or a plan to help our families and caregivers get smarter about Canvas as well so that we can leverage that platform um, both in the classroom and beyond the classroom in times of illness. If there were a situation of prolonged illness, then I think we might look at something a little bit differently. But for now, I think that that, that platform will help kids stay up um, of course, if they're super sick at home, we don't want we want them to focus on getting better. Alicia, anything to add? No, I would just say that um, the teachers will work with families, with parents to determine, you know, if they're well enough to to keep up with their work at home through Canvas, how much of their work, what to let go. And I think we'll, it'll just be really on a case by case with how the child is feeling. Great. 
Thank you very much. So um, Erica Zimmerman, followed by me relaying Carol's question that we weren't able to hear. Hi, thanks so much for this. This is really helpful. Um, I'm wondering if there are ways the community could help besides the mask drive, um, perhaps with materials or resources that would be helpful for outdoor learning. Is there anything else that the community um, might be useful for, for supporting the schools? Uh, well, I can, I can attempt to answer some of that. Uh, the, uh, we have some, it's trying to support the outdoor and learning uh, is obviously a big, I know that's a big hot topic in our communities in particular. Uh, trying to make sure that folks are going outside. We've we've had some donations. Uh, people are donating some tents and other pieces uh, at certain schools, uh, where where which helps uh, give an opportunities to have more outdoor possibilities. Uh, the only thing is, uh, we have to be also cognizant of the fact that when we do go outside, um, the uh, you know if we get tents and things, we also always have to be careful with the liability and other. There's a lot of other pieces to it. Uh, about setting up for outside. I know that sometimes it's cost prohibitive, but it's it's great when some a community member can make a donation, uh, but we also have to make sure that we install it the correct way so it's safe. And I, I know there's a big uh, movement to go out to make sure children are outside, but um, it's something that we, I know the principals have been working with, with their, within their own communities to try to figure out what they can or cannot do because every building and every campus is a little different. Uh, I don't know if uh, Gillian. I know. Uh, I know. I know Gillian was working on the facilities task force, and we talked about this. I don't know if Gillian, you have anything else to add? Yes. Well, not really much. I mean, because everybody is different, trying to utilize natural shade. I think there's a big difference between outdoor education, which is a really specific sort of curricular approach, mm -hmm. and getting kids outside. And what we're looking at is not shifting entirely to the outdoor learning curricular approach, but really looking at what are the opportunities that we have to get kids outside so that they can take the mask break. So for example, if you, you deliver um, a reading lesson and you deliver the specific sort of lesson, then kids can take their books and they can go outside and they can read. Or also thinking sort of depending on the different settings of the schools, what are ways that, you know, you can do some outdoor exploration or even do some science outside, like take a little insect census or whatever it is that, that you can possibly do. But it's not really about doing um, a specific outdoor education curriculum. It's really just about thinking of our schoolyards as extensions of our classrooms. Right. And, and so that that's what prompted my question actually was just thinking I'm a U32 parent. Um, so I'm not, I haven't heard yet, you know, specific requests that the community might make um, or that the schools might make. Um, and it could be that, you know, there's things the elementary schools could use that perhaps U32 parents could offer. So I guess it's just a, a word of encouragement that if there are materials you know, stuff, <laughs> physical stuff that would be helpful. Please put out the word and, and um, I'd be happy to help get the word out with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, love the spirit, Erica, thanks. Um, this is from Carol. She writes, like with most colleges where they're sending their students home for Thanksgiving break and not having them return, um, Will our district implement something like this? Second, is there any plan for transportation to U32 for practices and or games on remote weeks? So the first one is uh, we're going to follow, we're going to work with the uh, state guidance that we receive and, uh, and I'm sure that will be based upon um, any information regarding the medical metrics, the metrics that they're looking at on the ground at that time. So uh, we can't really make a decision about that uh, right now. Uh, and as for the U32, I can turn that one over to uh, uh, Stephen. 
I think I'm going to sound like a broken record on this one is that we're still working out the athletics piece, but we yeah. certainly are taking into consideration that some students m will not be on campus because they'll be in their remote week. And so um, we're looking at that as we develop the, the athletics practices or, or games or whatever that we're going to be involved in this year. So we'll we'll get that out soon. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, according to what I've got here, we're on to sort of a, a second round. Um, and uh, they're first up in the second round is Chris Stanley. Yes, thank you. The question that I have is, we know that between whether it's carpooling and CC, that pods are gonna get mixed. How is the close contact going to be tracked? Because you know you figure that somebody goes home sick, by the time they get tested, it's a couple of days later. Results are two to four days. So you're looking about a week later. You're going to try to expect a kid to remember who they were in close contact with. It's not going to happen. So who who's actually going to be tracking those those instances? Elizabeth, uh, I think it, I think the answer is the contact tracers, but I can turn that over to Elizabeth. Yeah, it, ultimately it will be them, but I, I understand what you're saying. You know, children won't remember, but certainly any any school based activity, there, there's attendance. So community connections knows who's there and where they've been, and they will be attempting to keep pod a little bit separate, and they'll be aware of that. In terms of like parents like having their own carpool. The parents should know if their children were in that carpool. So I think that would that would help. You know, it's not going to be we're in, within the school. We'll try very hard to keep pods together and to limit the the potential contact tracing that needs to happen should there be a, a positive case. Um, right. But what should it happen? You just want to make sure that it should it happen. I mean, you know, we all want to hope for the best. It's, it's plan for the worst, hope for the best. Right. But it's saying, you know, this should happen. This should. There needs to be a person responsible that says, yes, we will have this information. This is who will have it. So that when, you know, say it happens, all of a sudden you get the call that says, hey, we were doing a contact trace. Where was Johnny seven days ago? Who are the people he was with? Yeah. yeah. So, and I think uh, the, the, the answer is it's probably going to be easier to do that in their schools. Uh, because we take attendance and then the contact tracers will work with our school staff to know where the children were at any given time in the day. Uh, teachers also typically uh, take attendance when someone goes to the bathroom or if they have to go in, somewhere else in the building. So they should be, we should be able to do that quite easily. I think it's going to be more difficult uh, when you have, uh, you know, children are with us for uh, you know, one third of their day. So the other two thirds are not with us at all, right? Uh, one third, we're hoping they're sleeping at least. And then the other third, they're at home or they're in their communities. Uh, so I, I think I think it's going to be easier for us to do that uh, because we're going to have attendance as uh, as Elizabeth said. However, and we're uh, also going to be able to work with the contact tracers who will be able to uh, do that. And I, from what I understand, the, one of the reasons why Vermont is also looking so good is that Vermont is as uh, is currently is able it has enough contact tracers uh, that are on staff and are employed at the state Department of Health. Uh, to address uh, outbreaks if and when they do happen. Okay, thank you. So what, what I'm hearing is, is is you're going to make the assumption that everybody in the pod has had close contact because you're not gonna be able to keep track of the individual people that have had 15 minutes together. No, I think, I think, you know, within a classroom, there are assigned seats, children are in one place. And so you know who they're sitting beside and the expectation is that they're going to have masks on and they are going to be keeping distant. You know, especially, you know, there can be brief moments, but, and that's what the contact traces will be asking, you know, and we will have that information. We will know every adult who's been in that classroom. We will know, you know, if there's been any cross um, pod activities, we will, we will know that we're keeping track of that, but um, I think that there, within the classroom, we will know who's beside yeah. one another, and and if there's been like a lapse for some reason in the 
um, distancing, then then the contract chases will ask us, and we will be able to answer that. We we as as Brian said, we won't know what happened after school, you know, who kids are with, and that kind of stuff. But that they that's their job to cover the whole community, and they're really good at it. You know, the the outbreak that we had in in that happened up in. Uh, uh, in, where was it? Minuski. 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 Yep. It was a large outbreak, but it did not spread. You know, it did not become more community um, spread. It, they contained it because of the contact tracing that they were able to do, um, and we're we we hope for that as well. You know, um, I know that Mark Levine often says, you know, we should all be keeping a little notebook and 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 keeping track of everybody we we are with all day long, every day. And that's probably a little bit of an extreme, but I think when you have your children, I think you need to know who they're with and and how much time they've spent and be assured that they're doing what they can to be distant and to wear masks. That really decreases the uh, potential um, contagion markedly. Thank you very much. Um, I should note we have 10 minutes before we have to fold up this tent and um, move into the board meeting. And in the meantime, we also have a couple of new um, questioners that I'd like to get to, but also in the chat box, um, quick ones. Will middle school students get outside and take mask breaks? Or will there be a specific drop off or pick up by pod slash classroom? Amy, can you uh, address that? <laughs> Happy to, thank you. Yes, the middle school students will be going outside um, to take breaks as the weather allows. Um, we met with the, many of the middle school teachers yesterday and have done so a couple times. And that's been a large part of our discussion. Um, how do we have lunches outside? How do we, um, like was referenced earlier, how do we maybe teach um, the lesson and then also be able to get kids outside that, so they can physically distance and take their masks off at the same time. Um, I can't speak exactly to the process at all of the elementary schools, but at U32, we're still working out the final details about our uh, bus arrivals. We're expecting our buses to start arriving um, between 7.40 and 7.45, and um, we're going to space out the students that come into the building so that we can um, monitor them as they come in so they're not all clumping up, and uh, we're going to ask, if at all possible, for our drop-offs um, to happen as close to um, between 7.50 and 8 o'clock, again, to kind of help us spread out the number of students coming into the building at any one time. Thank you very much. Um, and David Lawrence, I must beg your indulgence. Um, Matthew Pelkey. Yeah, yeah, it's no worries, go. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Matthew Pelkey, followed by Larrabee Fellows. So this is actually Matt's wife, Heather McLean, um, and I'm wondering, I, I think that there could be a disincentive for parents to get their kids tested, even if they have a fever and COVID symptoms, if those parents can't take time off of work, like two weeks off of work, to be home with the kid. And I'm wondering how the district is going to handle that, like are tests required before a student returns to school if they have a fever and COVID symptoms, or is it recommended and, and how do we ensure that the students in my daughter's class are actually being tested? Elizabeth? So testing is, is in the situation that we have now in Vermont, testing, there, there's so few cases that testing is really not indicated and they're not um, promoting it. However, if a child has a certain, has some symptoms, they need to check in with their provider. And, and they're prepared for this. They know that, that this is coming, you know, and the, the provider will make the decision as far as testing goes. But a test, as, as somebody, as people have said, you know, you test one day and all that means is that, that in that moment, you're, you're negative. It do, doesn't mean the next day you won't be positive. And sometimes it allows people to kind of feel like, oh, good, I'm negative. I can, I can do more things. I can like take my mask off. I'm fine, but that's not the case. So in any event, you know, on a state level, they are not promoting testing at this time. And neither, neither do the pediatricians want to do it unless there's a, a higher indication that the symptoms look more like COVID and they would do a test. 
Um, the other thing is that children will be home longer. You know, it's not just, there's certain symptoms that are pretty reasonably, you can be pretty reasonably certain. I, I know um, what I've heard is like 99% of these symptoms are gonna be something else, you know, mm -hmm. but we still have to pay attention to them and we will pay attention to them. But it's, it's not like you need to fear every moment that if, if a child in your, in your child's classroom has, coughs that they have COVID. It's, it's, it's very, very unlikely. I don't know if that helps, but. No, that does, thank you so much. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, Larrabee Fellows. Hi, um, so I'm a parent of a kindergartner and a second grader, and um, they're both at Doty. And one of the things that came up in the spring is uh, just the complex nature of trying to manage two kids in the same school and just two kids. And I know that's not the case for everyone, but for parents who have two children in the same school and with the considerations um, regarding pods, I'm wondering if um, sort of a two part question, both for the learning part and the safety part, are there any things that parents of two kids in the same school need to be aware of, or is there um, additional support or anything that, that um, can be offered so that we can make sure to be both safe and also manage you know, both the different learning expectations? So uh, as the safety piece, uh, I, maybe it can be ex explained a little more. If you, have two, if you have two children in different grades in the same school, uh, what are the safety? Uh, what are, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the question. Can you uh, just elaborate a little bit more? Oh, I mean, just given the nature that we're trying to minimize contact between different pods of kids, obviously there's going to be, you know, there are siblings in schools in which yeah, case cross contact. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering, I mean, that just seems I'm based on <laughs> what yeah. I know about how um, families and, you know, kids work, mm -hmm. there are going to be um, multiple exposures across those pods. And I just wondered if there was anything the parents could need to do um, or need to be aware of going into that situation. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have anything in regards to that? Um, one thing is to um, encur encourage hand washing, wearing a mask. You know, those are the things that obviously there's going to be some cross, especially with siblings in two different rooms, you know, in two different classrooms. So they'll be in two different pods. So you have children at home now who are coming from two different pods. And I, I think that the mitigating factors, if, if we can encourage children and teach them and make it fun for them to wear masks and wash their hands, um, it, it will make all the difference. You know, I don't think there's anything particularly special. I know it's worrisome. So if, you, if, if one child in, a child in your, one of your children's class tested positive for COVID, you would of course be worried, but the contact traces would take care of that. If they felt like your child um, needed to be traced and needed to be tested, then that would, carry over to your other child, you know, because they obviously it's it's in with, with within one family. But, you know, I know we're trying to do everything to protect every child in every situation. And we can we can do so much and schools are going to do an enormous amount to to mitigate the factors that could it could um, enhance a spread. And it's not perfect, you know, and children and children don't need to be, um, you know, in a bubble uh, that's not necessary really especially not now in vermont i think you know that children need to be close to each other and they will be young children will be running around and they'll be close they won't you know we're not going to have um six foot uh things but it, to separate children but and that's okay it's not that's not going to increase the risk in a dramatic way the hand washing the mask wearing is the best thing that we can do for these kids Thanks. Great. Thanks very much. Um, two minutes until 6.30. Um, I, I think we need to wrap up, even though I'm leaving both uh, Dave Lawrence and Lisa Hanna hanging, and I know Lisa has something. Um, but can I just ask the attendees, if you think another public forum is warranted or not, uh, this is just a, a straw poll. If you think another public forum is warranted, could you please click yes 
And if you think you're good with what we've had here and um, you know, with the communications that we've got, click no. I just like to get a, a, a sense of the, um, of the room. I'm, I'm seeing a, um, of those who have answered, I'm seeing a preponderance of yeses over noes. Um, I can't guarantee that we'll have one, um, but, but it's good to know this. In the meantime, uh, I just want to thank um, each and every one of you for spending all this time. Um, and just reminder, today is August 19th. Um, in 10 days, it's September 8th. Uh, sorry, 20, 20, 20 days. No panic. However, on Monday, the teachers began uh, 10 days of their own in service. So this is all well in train. Um, when you mentioned Erica about what the community can do for the school, I think the, the single most important thing is to practice safe socializing. Um, as Elizabeth was saying, mask, distance, hands, washing, and the extent possible avoiding touching faces. Um, the only way that we can open school safely and keep it safe is if really if everybody does our part. Um, so that's what I hope we'll be able to do while uh, all of you, um, including teachers, have a great rest of your summer. Um, and Brian, yes. I just want to uh, re uh, reiterate, uh, please, if you have questions, uh, we, have, uh, we have our COVID-19 coordinator. We have people ready to answer them. Uh, if it's a school specific question, I encourage you to reach out to your principal. If it's, uh, uh, if you still need a, if you have a, a bigger qu a question that you think maybe should be asked to the COVID-19 coordinator, do we do have a, co a contact us button on our, on our district website for the, um, uh, the reopening plan. So, uh, which we update, we're gonna up update the frequently asked questions. Uh, we, we keep doing that on a regular basis. So I just encourage everyone, if you still have questions that you couldn't get answered because you ran out of time, uh, you know, obviously we can look at having another forum if that's if that's the appetite uh, of what everyone wants. Uh, if not, please feel free to um, yeah, reach out to our, our contact us button on the uh, COVID reopening website. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, just want to thank all of you who were able to make the community forum just now. Um, greatly appreciate it. Lots of interesting stuff. Um, welcome to all of you who are holdovers from that previous event um, and to all who are joining us for this one. Um, because of the community forum, we are leaving off the, the first round of public comments. Um, the, the public forum was really a kind of expanded freestanding um, set of public comments uh, in a sense. So we will have the public comments seg segment towards the end of the meeting. So um, do we have any agenda revisions? Floor. So I, I, I don't see it on the agenda. Could, could we do maybe in board operations, uh, the openings, the, uh, the open seat, uh, just a, a follow up on the open seat on the board in Worcester? Great idea. Um, so 4.3, uh, open seats, actually open seats in both middle sections. Yeah, in both, yeah, yeah. Okay, 4.3, new 4.3, open seats. Um, anybody else? No objections, I take it, to that addition. Okay, good. Um, in that case, Towns, you're up. Hi, yeah. Um, I don't, as far as from a student perspective, I don't have a lot to report that is um, super new with the possible uh, pretty exciting news that uh, today, um, students got to look at their schedules uh, for the first time and like really see what their own personal schedule for the school year is going to look like. Um, 
so that's probably you know one of the more exciting and concrete uh, pieces of information that will really tell students what school is actually going to look like for them. There's also been a lot of gr really great information um, about you know how the actual day is going to work and also who to talk to to address possible changes in the schedule. And I um, really just want to, I guess, say that I'm really thankful um, to everyone who's been working really hard to get all this information out because it has meant a lot, at least to me, and I'm sure to many other students um, that, you know, this concreteness and something that we is pretty normal like this schedule has gone a long way in um, helping people prepare for the upcoming school year. Um, so I really, I just want to say thanks to, um, I guess, everyone who's been working uh, on getting this information out to the students because it's, it's very much appreciated. Fantastic. Thank you, Towns. Um, board members, any questions for Towns? Steven? Yes, Steven? <laughs> I'm not a board member, uh, but uh, the big kudos go out to uh, Lisa LaPlante for oh, all yes. um, in getting all this out. And um, I would also say just to the whole board um, that we do have a vacancy as well for the student uh, part of this, and we will be working on getting our new student rep identified and on the board uh, to assist towns as we get the school year started, just so you guys are aware that we're not going to put it all on towns for this whole year. Excellent. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and thank you very much, Towns. That was very good. Um, so uh, moving on to 4.1, board retreat. Floor, would you like to? <laughs> Sorry. Sure, sure. I, yeah. So 4.3, you're in the board. Sorry, I was, they were talking to me at the same time. So board retreat, it, you're muted now. Yeah. So we are. Uh, we had. Uh, we have a location now for our our board our, our board retreat. Uh, should I share it with them, or we wait until we send to everybody? Or right now is a good time. Uh, so we are gonna do it. We went into between a mixed or being close to home and really trying to find a place that had opening and they also had enough space outdoor for us to be able to be outdoors or be inside if the weather doesn't permit. So we were able to book a space at a, a Trap Family Lodge. They have a lot less people right now coming to, to there. So we're going to use the upper room, uh, the master room that holds usually 150 people. But it would be just the 15 to 16 people if we have a, a new board member join us plus our facilitator. It, they're giving us a really good deal. It is not more expensive than we tried even renting a, a tent to do it here. And it's, it's, it's really affordable because we are in COVID, they're not holding events. So, and our facilitator is coming, he would be staying in town. So it's easy for him to, to travel to the location. And I will let the rest be, Brian, if you have something else to add, uh, as far as we haven't done all of the details yet on, uh, on if we're gonna try to keep our presentations, PowerPoint presentations to minimum. So we don't have an agenda to share, to share completely yet, but Brian, can you add anything that I'm uh, missing? Uh I think uh, if it's the, the, I know you've been looking at all sorts of places. I know it's been very difficult to find places. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, do we have a uh, the place the trap lodge that that will also include breakfast and lunch for the uh, board members yeah. and everyone. That's the idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and and Michelle and I coordinated and and it's all a uh, book. It was really hard to find a, a place that had a enough room, but mostly that they had an opening okay. uh, for, uh, for us. Thank you very, very much, Flora. I, I know you worked hard on this. And um, uh, before I open it to board members, I just want to make sure that it's understood that even though um, the optics might not be the best about, oh, the school board is gold plating its retreat experience or whatever. It's not the case. This is, this is cheap. 
um, and uh, because of the situation that Flo explained. So uh, it's not gold-plated, we're just lucky. And anytime we get lucky, I say we go for it. Um, but board members, uh, uh, comments. You good with it? Um, will there be a remote option? There, there should be a, a remote option. Yeah, yes. there, were, there, there is, there is internet. Uh, you know, there's enough Wi-Fi for it to be, uh, for us to be outside and to be, to be inside as well ventilated. To uh, Jonas and we, the way that we were setting it up also is for everybody to be able to be six feet apart. But yes, there would be a, there would be a remote option. Obviously, if we're going in and out, the remote option is not as flexible, right? In uh, whatever we, we should look into that to make sure that you're able to see everybody or whoever decides to do it remote. But yeah, the idea is that we have everybody participating and right now everybody uh, can participate and Stephen Luke was working on his agenda, but I'm counting on a full board retreat. We are counting, this is for all. Mm. Kari. Yeah, thanks. Um... I, I missed the last meeting, so you may have already covered this, but have we defined our goals for this retreat or are we going to do that um, as a step in this? Brian, I, I'm going to let you speak. Scott and myself uh, and Brian met with the facilitator and we're going to have one, uh, one more meeting for what I understand for finalizing the, the retreat. Uh, we did share, you had shared some comments with us, uh, Kari, before, and we did share those. We're trying to simplify it. And Ryan really uh, speak uh, to it, to the, to the essence of it. Yeah, so to, to not oversimplify it, but uh, I think the idea was uh, the, the ultimate thing is really to have the board, from what I understand, uh, speaking with uh, Scott and Floor, and the facilitator is really to have uh, a lot of board member participation uh, to really uh, talk. I mean, I, I, the district is brand new. A lot of folks have been through a lot of different uh, challenges with school, school consolidation, merging with Act 46. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, you know, it's been an interesting time with the pandemic. This would be a really great time for the board really to uh, really get to work with each other and talk about what they want, uh, where they see the district going. And I think the ultimate goal of any type of retreat is to come out with some sort of tangible uh, piece that you can present to the community uh, about you know, goals or where we're, what we did during this time. I, I think it's uh, you know, an important part of the work of a retreat. Uh, so I think there's some questions that there are some questions that uh, would, be, would be asked, uh, making sure that everyone participates, uh, participating with an open mind and, and listening, active listening, uh, also uh, definitely participating and sharing your ideas uh, to, and uh, making sure that everyone is, uh, is given a voice at the table at the board, from the board. So ultimately, though, after getting to go, uh, the facilitator should be taking us through a process where uh, folks are, are able to participate and speak and share and also then uh, try to come up with some tangibles like goals uh, and what are some goals that the collective board would want to focus on this year and possibly even into the future. Right, um, and, and I think uh, uh, goals, values, norms yes. are sort of the, um, the big three that... Um, but I, can I also just say though, I think uh, it, it's, it's Scott, exactly, it's their goals, values, norms, but I also think though that the big piece I know the facilitator emphasized with us was also that it's very important uh, for board members to participate and to share because um, uh, it's gonna be hard to get to the goals without people putting themselves uh, out there with, with sharing what their ideas are or what their thoughts are regarding the district. Yes. Yeah. So um, participation is is key. Active participation. Yes. Sorry, Laura. Yeah. So we and we sorry we had a really really long list and one of the things that Nick said especially to me was that you know what are our priorities it was and having something tangible at the end so I like I said I share all of 
your, you know, from the quality, from everything that we that we had. But I think we boil it down to three specifics and uh, and and mostly getting to know each other and and coming together as yeah. uh, as 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 one and and getting to know uh, Brian. And we'll all be participating at the same level because Nick is going to be doing all of the uh, facilitating. So that's that's what. That's what we have so far. Thank you very much. Um, other uh, other board member comment, um, Chris, and then Shaya. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Scott. Okay. Um, just can we just have a um, confirmation from the facilitator that he is aware of the quarantining requirements if he's coming from an area that is. Um, that he needs to quarantine. Is it, you know, just that would be to me terrible if a question was raised and, and he did, you know, he hadn't met the requirements for us um, just because we have to be aware of it with school opening and things like that. Uh, just a housekeeping matter. Um, otherwise, I'm looking forward to this retreat. Thanks. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. I, can, I will definitely, I, I believe he is aware, but I will definitely follow up with him to make sure he's aware. Great. Great, Brian. Um, Jaya. Hi. Um, I am wondering what the date was that we picked. I haven't seen that actually anywhere. Um, so it's September 12th, Jael, and you and I talked at the last meeting, and I, I, I sent you a personal email, and you said that that date. Okay. Did, the text. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I wasn't sure if that was yes it's, finalized. It's, yeah, September okay. September 12th. 8 8 30 right. what we hadn't shared and we should share right now is we just said morning and afternoon with 8 30 to 2. okay great thank you look good that's great anything else on board retreat anybody would like to ask or contribute if not we can move on to board calendar draft 4.2 on page two This is um, Board Calendar Draft, Normal Life Edition. How does it look to you? Besides very pretty with all its colors. <laughs> well, can I just, can I just, uh, just say that at the bottom of it, obviously that's if, if uh, we were able to move to step three and hold meetings not you know not necessarily remotely but uh yeah, so we probably have to ignore that part on the bottom but we put that there to be hopeful <laughs> thank you very much um so uh kari i notice your furrowed brow um is there anything you're a very attentive uh, facilitator scott <laughs> i'm just trying to find the what uh what Brian's referring to, I didn't see. Is, did you, Brian, did you say that's the bottom of the yeah, of that page? Yeah, so on the bottom of the page, it, it, hopefully you're looking at the right, uh, the, there's two different calendars in there. This is called the uh, board meeting calendar draft uh, at the top of the page. And uh, if you go to the bottom, it says uh, locations, uh, U32 middle high school, you know, the first, every first Wednesday of the month. And then it rotates with Berlin, Calais, Doty, East Montpelier, and Rumney with the different dates. So we put those in there being, you know, we put those in there trying to be, uh, you know, give you an idea of what it could be, uh, but those are just some samples. Got so, it. Thank you. So I think the other, the other piece is, uh, uh, one of the things is, I know we discussed not having uh, committee meetings in the month of September. Uh, I think we may need to have a finance committee meeting uh, sooner than, you know, sometime in September. Uh, to discuss a couple things with finance, but uh, but other than that, the regular two board meetings, I, it's it's helpful to not hold, have all the finance have all the other meetings in the first month of September, uh, based on uh, the board fee, based on we're opening school and we want to be prepared for pivoting or whatever could happen when we reopen on September eighth. Understood. Great. Okay, um, so this is a draft. Um, 
Does anybody have any uh, suggested changes beyond what Brian has just mentioned? Shall, um, I, I guess next time maybe, oh, Diane. So one of the things I'm wondering, and um, Jen would, would know better, uh, would be just whether or not the quality committee needs to be reviewing anything in preparation for potentially if we shift to remote again, or is there something that the quality committee should be looking at in terms of your virtual teaching that's going on? Or, um, you know, because October 21st is pretty late out, which if we're just looking at typical things would be fine, but didn't know if we needed to be reviewing or keeping an eye on anything. So, so what I would say is that I think we have to be prepared uh, like, I, I, I'll be hold a special committee meeting if we have to. Uh, but as of right now, um, you know, the only thing that we're thinking about is just making sure we reopen the school in September. If there is something that comes up, we may have to call. I mean, I, I was hoping not to have another finance committee meeting. Um, you know, come, we've had so many of them already this summer, but I think I think we're going to have to have another finance committee meeting uh, sooner rather than later. So we may have to. So if something does come up from Ed Quality. Uh, we would have to be prepared to call that meeting. Okay, good. So um, I guess the uh, the meeting calendar as it is can can proceed. There's no action necessary on this, I take it. We'll just continue to refine it and then um, it's a working draft, correct? I, I, well, hopefully it'll become the official draft, but uh, I do think we just have to be flexible uh, in September, in particular, as the school year progresses. Right, right. Um, Jonas and then Floor. Um, are we going to stick to the 6.30 start time? Uh, we, we had done that during the, during the last year. Um, yes. We've been meeting a little bit earlier than that, uh, uh, most, most of these meetings. I just wondered if, um, you know, what the right start time is. Um, good question. Flo? I, I think that's a decision, a decision for everybody to, to make it, you know, if meeting at six, if, if it's visible, JL, I know had a meeting at six before six thirty. So I don't know, I will, you know, everybody should have to, jump in on that six o'clock would help um, i think for administrators too so we're not in considering we our meetings are really long <laughs> yeah. but it's it's up for uh, everybody we just kept what what we had and and the only other thing i wanted to to add is that we are looking at a at a after our board retreat we will go back at looking at our board goals and and calendar for the following year and that would help guide, for example, Diane's question about where the quality committee needs to meet when we're doing the monitoring, but everything is looking different because of COVID. But I, I will let the, you know, both administrators and board members chime, if everybody could raise their hand and say, yes, I can meet at six. Yes, I, I think Chael has something she might wish to say. I can, um, I can meet at six because I'm not driving up to Burlington. So that was the issue getting back from Burlington in time. Okay, so um, how about if board members, uh, per floor suggestion, straw poll, if six o'clock works for you, um, maybe raise your hand or, or, or perhaps um, what we could do is, if it doesn't work for you, just speak out. Can't we do yes or no with our little yeah. buttons? Sure, if you want to do yes or no. Six o'clock, the question is six. Okay. Um, oh, Car oh, Caroline. And do six, and okay. Six, okay. So, 6.30. Well, um, that, right. Um, and no, if mine is still marked, if you said Caroline, it might have been marked from before. I did not mean to vote at all because oh. I'm not a board member. 
right. Okay. I undid it. It was the, from voting before. So ignore <laughs> that. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. And that can... board member, can you meet at six? <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought we had a new board if member. If I were a board member, personally, I would prefer six. So my vote would be yes if I were a board member. <laughs> okay. So we even have hypothetical votes in, for <laughs> six o'clock. Great. Um, uh, six o'clock it is then. There's Versus one no. Um, who's? Uh, Dorothy's. Oh, says Dorothy. Yeah, Dorothy's a no. Dorothy, um, six o'clock doesn't work for you. I mean, six. Uh, I, actually, it works. I prefer six thirty. <laughs> oh, you prefer six thirty? Okay. And it, it can work, but I prefer the six thirty. Okay, I hear you. Um, uh, can you can you live with six in the meantime? Sure. <laughs> we'll make it up to you somehow. <laughs> Thanks. <sure> well. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, very good then. Um, how about we go to four point three uh, open seats? So um, update on. Middlesex, then Worcester. Chris, um, do you mind? Yeah, so, no, not at all. So I posted on uh, Front Porch Forum uh, that the um, any interested members to submit a letter of interest to Scott um, and that the period of time for responding would close, I think it's this Friday, uh, the 21st. Um, I believe that's the date. Uh, and my understanding is that there have been two letters of interest that have been sent. I haven't, I'm not aware of any others at this time. I'm only aware of two as well. Um, one is Caroline May, and the other is Dennis Hill from Middlesex. Um, so the, uh, after the 21st, our next regular board meeting would be September 2nd, according to the calendar, unless we have a special board meeting, which Brian is nodding at the possibility of, um, at which point I think, uh, would you be willing to consider the question then, board members? Great. Yes. That would accelerate the process. That would be good. All right. But again, um, do we, is there a part of this that goes before the select board? I just remember no. that being part of the process before though. I thought for Jonathan. It, 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 you're, you're absolutely right about that, but it is not part of the process now. I, I, I think I circulated the statute that it's the board's decision and we can let the select board know who we pick, um, but the select board does is not a, um, the decision maker on that. They used to be. Uh, but they aren't now. Right. And I think it's a good idea as a courtesy yeah, to let this be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. So um, that leaves Worcester. It, uh, is there any, um, any update on Worcester? Both Jael and I have have canvassed uh, the folks that we know in town. Uh, in the past few months, we've reached out to um, you know, the school board. We talked to people at town meeting, even though that seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, and for, for me, and you know, I can't speak for Jael, uh, we have not turned up anyone in Worcester uh, willing to serve. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear it. Um, for my part, I tried to uh, I tried to recruit Towns, but he's underage, unfortunately. Um, I, I hope that at some point someone will will be struck with the um, whatever it takes, um, tongues of fire or whatever. Um, so that's inviting. <laughs> yeah. Um, any. <laughs> Anybody have any ideas about this? Lindy? Um, you're muted, Lindy? Going back and forth. No, now I'm okay. Um, if there's been anything in Gillian's newsletters, I, I read them, but I don't say that I can remember if I've seen that, that might go to a broader community. I don't know. 
Um, I haven't put anything in my newsletters because I didn't know if it was appropriate, like, you know, just because in terms of the boundary stuff, but if, um, if I'll, I'll, if Brian says it's okay, I'm happy to put one in. <laughs> And I, and I and I think Gillian, you're right. Uh, you, we don't want to. Uh, we don't want to have you writing about board business without the board um, telling uh, telling us that. Hey, can you put this in? So, if someone from the board would prefer to send Gillian a little blurb about what would be what we what, what she say, what she can say in her next newsletter, I think that would be helpful. Gillian, I'd be fine if you recycled. You know what we put in in, uh, in March. Yeah. <laughs> that was like a hundred years ago, Donuts. <laughs> I, I, I know, but you know, the job is still the same. <laughs> do you, do the you language have, hasn't changed that can, much. Can you can you forward that? I'll, do you I'll still have... that. I'll find Thank that. you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. But um, I must say, just as an aside, I, I greatly appreciate the attention to um, proper process. Thank you. Um, good. Uh, Anything, anything else on just filling board vacancies or looking ahead to recruiting future board members? Um, Fleur? I'm wondering, Scott, if, if maybe you could put something out through Brian or through Michelle and just, again, posting the two vacancy for also as an extra one, because you you know, if any other member of the in a neighboring community could know somebody in Worcester, we all been trying and with no luck in in Worcester. But a, and and list maybe list the three openings: Worcester, Middlesex, and a, help Stephen to say that there's going to be an opening for a a, a junior <laughs> to join the the school board. So so it's kind of official. It's very inviting from the entire board. A, that would be great, I think. Yes, Brian. And, and if uh, if someone from the board would like to send that to me and copy uh, copy Michelle, we'll make sure we get it out on my next Friday my Friday newsletter that goes out to the community. We could do that. Sure, I, I'd be happy to do that. Um, Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, very well, good. Can I just ask a clarifying? Can I ask a clarifying question? By all means. Um, uh, so wait, I thought though Chris had already put a deadline on the um, uh, interest in the Middlesex one. So I don't think we want to re-advertise that because I think the deadline will have already passed. Yeah. We'll Chris, do I have that straight? Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yes. Okay. Friday is the deadline. Quite right. So um, just do the other two. <laughs> yes. Um, Lindy, did you have something? No? Okay. Um, very good. So uh, that's 4.3, unless anyone yeah. has anything further. Scott, this is Steve Look. Yes, Stephen. Great. My camera's been off now that it's on. You're ignoring me, so I apologize. I'm having to butt in. Um, what's the board process going to be to select the the new board members? Uh, I will share the um, the letters of interest with board members, and it will have a will have a vote. I guess basically. Um, do you have any other suggestions? It's just in my experience, the board has interviewed interesting, interested parties um, that were interested in filling the position. It, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I, I just, I, I think we need to know the method we're going to utilize to select. We've got two from Middlesex, so we're going to have to pick one of them. Um, and if yeah, that's the yeah. process, you'll just give the letters and we'll read them ahead of time and just vote based on the letters. I'm, I'm okay with it. I just want to know what the I'm, process is. No, I, I, I actually prefer your idea. Um, the uh, Inviting the candidates to the board meeting and giving them a chance to, um, to introduce themselves and, and talk a little bit about um, why they're interested and, um, you know, their motivation, all of that. I think that would be great. That's an excellent suggestion. Thanks. Do, uh, any objections to doing it that way? Great. No, I fully support that. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, good. 
So uh, we can move on to 5.1.1 in that case, school reopening update. Brian? Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been a, a very productive uh, week since we last, uh, or last, two weeks since we've done our uh, last board meeting. We uh, ultimately got information about staff leave procedures. I, I, I just want to thank the board. Uh, and I also want to also give a uh, major um, shout out to Carla Messier. She's not here today, but uh, she has been working around the clock, uh, weekends, night, uh, trying to make sure she's answering teachers and faculty questions around the leave procedures, uh, done an outstanding job in this uh, area. The, uh, we were able to, uh, insert the stats that came in, we had four teachers apply for emergency family medical leave. Uh, six staff, faculty and staff did apply for unpaid leave. Um, we'll be uh, asking for your recommendations on, on them, that their, their names are in the board packet uh, for uh, tonight, later on in the agenda. Uh, we did have five teachers uh, take us up on the uh, enrolling their children in our schools. This will allow us to uh, ensure that these teachers are not taking leave, so they will be here for our children, and we'll be there for theirs. Um, and that was a, something that was also very unique to our district. And I do have to say that the board, uh, in my humble opinion, has been very generous and very helpful in this regards. Um, the, uh, we also did look at, uh, there, were, there was one family that did uh, look into a remote, the remote option, but there was only one teacher that had a remote option. Uh, it was only uh, two students. It would not have justified uh, the cost of hiring supervision or providing supervision for that one teacher. We didn't have enough folks to do the remote option for uh, that was on the table. Um, so that, that was not there. But however, we are gonna be taking in uh, with your approval, and we'll talk more about this uh, in later in the agenda for the eight students. And that and it should be easily absorbed in the schools at the grade levels where they'll be. Um, and we'll still be able to keep our social distance. Uh, and and it, it, it seems, you know, I, I'm knocking on wood, but uh, it seems that, uh, I've, I've met with some parents over this past week, and they say that they're very fortunate and lucky to uh, be in Washington Central School District, where schools are reopening uh, full time. And also, and also, some other parents are very happy that we're offering a remote option, a full remote option, especially for our young, our young children. Uh, and I also feel that we've we've been lucky in regards to uh, the number of uh, students that could come in. Uh, we were anticipating this to be much higher than eight. Uh, and it, that did not happen, it did not play out. Uh, we also did uh, interview for remote learning. Uh, I'm happy to say as of currently, uh, we had a list of teachers who were selected uh, for remote learning. This was, uh, we first allowed teachers to uh, apply and get, uh, and get involved and see if they were interested. The uh, elementary principals, uh, along with, uh, again, uh, Carla uh, did a really great job with, uh, interviewing uh, Jen Miller. I also want to thank her. And I also want to uh, thank Kelly. I don't know. I, 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 Kelly's been absolutely help, very helpful, especially in making sure that our special education students who have selected remote are, are, are uh, represented with a special education remote teacher. So these six teachers that are listed here, uh, this is a reallocation of positions. It's a transfer. It's a kind of a, uh, a nice way of uh, doing this in a, uh, this is one of the I would say positives of it being a school district. It's a lot easier to uh, do this uh, kind of work. Uh, we did again allow people to apply. Some people were that applied were selected. Other people um, were selected. Be, uh, they had indicated an interest, and uh, these folks are, I think, going to do a great job uh, with our remote learning uh, possibilities moving forward. Uh, one thing that is just so one thing uh, there is some things that we do have to do. We did do. Uh, with regarding to a, when you, anytime you select someone, uh, sometimes it creates a ripple effect in the school. Uh, there was one uh, ripple effect, just so everyone's aware. Uh, that was uh, it, what, giving uh, the, at Doty, anytime, Doty's a small school, so anytime a staff member is changed, it does create more of a ripple effect than possibly at the other schools. And uh, we're very happy that Lisa Hanna is gonna be our grade five and six teacher. It did create a vacancy. Uh, we did have uh, a teacher in Doty who uh, was, was going to take that position for the year uh, until uh, 
uh, hopefully that's hopefully only this year because of the uh, COVID. Hopefully we're hoping that there'll be some end to this pandemic. Uh, what it did do, it did create an, an opening at the uh, for an interventionist, and we were able to, uh, as the superintendent, I elected my uh, responsibility to uh, transfer someone else, a teacher from another position into Doty. Uh, one of the big things is I, I'm, I'm being very careful in trying to. I know we spent money on facilities and getting our schools up, but uh, I'm very happy that this was a cost neutral option for our district. It, didn't, it did not cost us any additional funding. Uh, so the board is aware. Uh, I think transferring teachers from sc across schools, while not desirable, uh, will happen from time to time. I think that might be new for our schools. I think it's new for our administrative team, my leadership team. I also think it's new for um, you know the communities. So it's a, but however, um, you know this is this is kind of the way a district works. You do transfer across schools when the need arises, instead of posting for new positions which uh, it could become very costly. And so that is a, an advantage of uh, being a consolidated school district. And uh, it, this, this was the first time that uh, we did it. Uh, it will probably not be the last time. Thanks, Brian. Board member questions? Dorothy. I have a question about the, and I have right along and I never asked it before, the emergency family medical leave. My understanding was that that only goes until December 31st. Is that correct? And then what happens? Uh, th yes. So, so then what happens is uh, we'll, help, we'll have to see if the state uh, or federal government will continue, how they're going to uh, respond with uh, the leave, the leave request. These are, uh, the, again, these are teachers who are it might be a few days. One teacher, for example, could not be here next week or the week after uh, because because of a prior commitment, and she had and she couldn't do it. And it, her her reasoning fell under the EFMLA. So it might not be something that we have to be too concerned about just yet. But I think uh, you know we'll, we'll definitely monitor the law, see if the uh, Vermont legislature passes something, if uh, there's any additional information. But uh, you know, we're we're able to accommodate those teachers right now. Thanks. If they come back, I'm you can saying accommodate those teachers if they come back in January. Is that what I'm asking? No, no, no. Uh, we'll be able to see if we can accommodate those. Some of those teachers are taking a day, a day off oh, here oh, or there. Not for the until December 30th. No, 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 no. That's oh. that's not the. Mm -mm, okay. No, that's fine. I, I just assumed that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks, Chris McVeigh. Um, I'm sorry, this is a little bit off topic, but it's on topic for leaves. Do we have a number on how many um, staff members um, applied for and actually accepted uh, the early retirement option that we floated a couple of months ago? Because I think the deadline is passed now. Um, I may be wrong, but I thought it was passed. Yes. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we had one additional uh, member uh, Actually, write write to me today. Uh, write to me. I'm sorry, recently uh, about the uh, about the uh, early retirement. So we may have one additional from the four. I think we had four uh, earlier in the summer, is what I recall. But uh, I think we may have one additional person uh, that that uh, submitted, and it's not official so, until they actually. There's other paperwork that they need to sign, but Carla will be working on that, uh, and we'll probably hopefully have more information for our, our next uh, our next board meeting, which I'm hoping will be a personnel type of special meeting around personnel. Okay, I, I, great, thank you. Thanks. Other, other board member questions? Um, everybody's okay with this? Yeah, there's uh, just one thing. There's another thing that's not included in my packet, but I thought it was timely. Uh, the, we have submitted, and uh, I know, uh, I, I, I thank you, uh, thank you, Dorothy, for also, uh, uh, reaching out to me this past week, the uh, we did submit a, a grant application through Efficiency Vermont. Uh, they, uh, for, for just so you're aware, uh, looking at our ventilation systems, paying for our isolation rooms. Uh, these these are you know, fairly big ticket items, and uh, we're trying to make sure we're getting reimbursement. And so we have submitted our gr a grant through Efficiency Vermont. 
from what I understand, they're ready to uh, execute and give us something. Uh, we're just waiting for the governor to sign the agreement. I'm not sure if the gov if governor Scott has yet assigned the agreement or not with Efficiency Vermont, but that is the one one of the big things that we're waiting for to come end up. Uh, depending on what we find out this week, we may need to call for a special meeting with the finance committee just to update them regarding those uh, those uh, expenditures. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, any if there's nothing further on school reopening update, we can move on to 5.1.2, school calendar on page four of the packet. So uh, I'm gonna turn, uh, Jen, Jen Miller-Arsenault has done, uh, has worked with me and our leadership team on, on the, uh, and also with our, uh, we've also worked with our uh, Labor Management Council with the union on this uh, document. Uh, so I'm gonna have uh, Jen uh, take over here and explain uh, the calendar, revised calendar. Uh, now, I, I also understand that it's, you know, we also, it would be, I, I understand that tradition dictates that we bring this to the board for your approval. Uh, I know, I don't think legally or statutorily it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's required. Uh, however, we, I, I, in being a, sometimes being a traditionalist and a new guy in the block, I want to make sure that uh, I'm, I'm doing this, doing this on the up and up with everyone. So uh, we, we would probably like a, uh, a vote from the board, school board uh, if, if, if you think it's necessary or if you, that's something that you want to do or continue to do. Uh, but I'll turn it over to Jen. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So when the governor announced the statewide student start date at September of September 8th, we looked at our calendar. We had originally actually been slated to start uh, this week, yesterday, with Teacher In-Service Day and go forward. So we um, are proposing that we push everything. For, so our first uh, teacher and paraeducator day is next Monday. And that instead of having 180 student days, we have 175 student days. That will allow us to, um, to prepare around health and safety measures, social emotional learning, and the curriculum instruction and assessment plan that I alluded to during the, the community forum. I included in the board packet for you sort of that skeletal outline of planning. I took out all the nuts and bolts and details for you and some of it is still quite frankly under development. But the plan would allow us to, um, to ensure that everybody who's working in our schools is, uh, is prepared to open as successfully as possible. So that's the proposal that would have us um, having our student days end a week later right now with 175 days. We also, when we were looking at the calendar, we're thinking about the in-service days that are already built in the calendar and they serve an important purpose. <laughs> and they're days that we think we need around um, continuing to align with some of the federal holidays and maximizing in-service uh, time. So taking stock of where we are in October and, uh, and regrouping uh, as, as necessary. We have days for the um, parent-teacher-student conferences in November and April. We have a half day on Martin Luther King Day, which is gonna be a focus on issues of equity and diversity. It's also contractually a half day professional day for our teachers. And similarly, one day in June, which would be a day to wrap up together and a half day professional day for our teachers, historically when they are doing their report cards. So that is the current proposal. And um, a lot of folks have um, have done a lot of thinking and looking at the calendar and, and the in-service plans in terms of all of the task force work coming together so that we have time to reopen successfully. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, questions for uh, Brian or Jen? No, uh, what about the, uh, my recollection is that um, if we shorten, uh, on those occasions when we've shortened the, um, the school year from 180 days, that uh, we have taken action on that. Um, would any board member with a better memory than mine care to, um, 
care to relate your recollection? Uh, Scott, there's no harm in making, taking a motion, um, just regardless of what our recollections are, um, to safeguard it. Okay. Would you like to do the honors then, Chris? I, I'm happy to move that we reduce the student days for the 2020-2021 school year from 180 days to 175 days, um, as recommended. Very good. Uh, do we have a second? I will. I will second that and and ask if um, Chris will take a friendly amendment to approve the calendar uh, as it's been presented to us by Brian. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, Chris and Jonas, with uh, the friendly amendment, uh, Lisa, are you, are you in there somewhere? Um, did you catch that? I am Scott. Oh, very good. Great. And, and you got it. That's I got wonderful. it. Thank you very much. Um, discretion. Kari, Scott, sorry. Scott. Um, can Brian, can you remind us how uh, snow days or weather days would affect this? Uh, yes, you uh, read my mind. So uh, if you look at, I was just about to uh, chime in on that. The uh, if you there is the, do we have contingency days based on uh, June 18th to June 24th, if we have to use those for snow days? Uh, the big question I have is with with our Canvas system set up, being set up, and, you know, and I, 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 you know, this might be like a bomb dropping here, but uh, there might, we might never, we might have seen the end of snow days. Uh, there might not be a reason to have snow days any longer. Uh, if we now have remote learning. So if, so if everyone's going to remote because of a snow day or a snowstorm, we may be able to deliver instruction at home. And so, but, but we still do have contingency days if, that, if uh, we don't have to do the snow day. If we still have to do the snow days for some reason, we do have these contingency days. Uh, so that's something that you know, we're definitely, we've been thinking about recently. Fortunately, no students within earshot in my house. <laughs> Uh, oh man, yeah, I, we're not going there right now. No way, <laughs> not this second. That's that's a complicated conversation. Uh, <laughs> maybe we should put this up for a oh. referendum at the school. <laughs> yeah, we had such a nice, we had such a lovely public forum on our pandemic, but I bet I bet canceling snow days would would provoke a reaction. <laughs> Yeah. In like well, five well, straight well, months of snow <laughs> days, and my kids are sick of it. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't have a kid in school anymore, but boy, does he love a powder day. So. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, Lindy has something. I'm totally in favor of making snow days remote learning days. And if they go skiing, they could still do some of the work later on or something, check in for that morning meeting before they head to the mountain but not go to school till July because ending on the 18th. Yeah, really and, that's true. And what I think Lindy, we learned from this that we can do things remotely. Yeah, uh, and what Lindy said is uh, very important, checking in for your morning meeting and you know, it, it comes down to how, how do we uh, take attendance on, on those days? So I got you, Lindy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Okay, so before Stephen Look um, calls me out on, on talking about snow days instead of the topic at hand, even though it is part of the topic at hand, um, I want to go to a vote on the motion um, approving the, the school calendar. All in favor, please click yes, no, click no. Scott, uh, my internet dropped, so I'm a yay. You're a yay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jaya. And uh, I see unanimous vote. Excellent. Okay. Um, that's great. So, um, consent agenda 6.1, approving the minutes of July 30th and uh, August 5th starting on page eight. Would anyone like to move the minutes of those two days? 
two meetings. This is I Diane and I so move. Thank you. I will second. Diane moves, Jonas seconds. Any changes, any questions, any comments? If not, all in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. Yay. <laughs> or say yay if you're a child. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Jael. Um, very good. Once again, passes unanimously. Um, now, the board orders. If um, anyone who happens to have the board orders up and handy, uh, may I impose on you to move them, Jonas? I do. I move to approve the board orders in the amount of $232,584.93 and $397,413.06. And Thank you, Jonas. Is there a second? I will second that. Second. Oh, okay. Um, I'll take Floor as the second. Thanks, everyone. Um, Lisa, were you able to get that okay? Great. Okay, thanks. Um, any questions about uh, any of the board orders? If not, all in favor? of approving the board orders as moved by Jonas and seconded by Floor. Please click yes. Opposed, click no. And again, um, I see unanimous passage. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, that takes us to 7.1, approving uh, personnel actions. Um, and in this batch, there, unless there's some change to what we have, which I'm sure Brian will signal if that's the case, there are um, leave of absence requests. And I wonder if I could ask someone to kindly make that motion and reading out the names. Uh, oh, Brian, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to preface before the board does anything that everyone does understand. These are all unpaid leaves for the entire school year. Uh, we are not paying insurance. Uh, they all know that the uh, staff has the option to pay their own way using COBRA uh, for that. And, uh, and uh, again, this is for the upcoming school year. Great. Thank you very much. Um, anybody care to make the motion? So I'll, I'll move that we... Who's that? Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Um, Jonas. Um, I move that we authorize leave requests uh, for the 2020-2021 school year uh, without pay for the following um, employees. Do we need the schools involved or just the names? Um, I, I think it's fine to have the names. Okay. Um, Amber Perry, Jackie Taylor, Robert Reed, Dina Cox, Nicole Schaefer, and Peter Comptis. Great. Um, Jonas, would I, would I take your um, gesture as a second? Thank you very much. So Chris moves, Jonas seconds. Uh, is there any discussion of these leave of absence requests? Questions? <laughs> Thank you, Brian, for your clarification earlier. Um, so uh, all in favor of approving these leave of absence requests, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And once again, I see all yeses. So the leave requests are unanimously approved. Many thanks, everyone. Um, so uh, now we're at the, um, the second, the late stage. Oh, sorry, Brian. Yes, I also just want the board to be aware uh, for full transparency 
uh, that uh, U32 is uh, has been has been advertising for an anticipated middle school math opening. I want everyone to know that this is already in the budget. It's just a heads up. Uh, we do have uh, two part-time positions that are, are not gonna be used this year. And that adds into a 1.0 FTE. Uh, I've, been, I've worked with the uh, principal on this and we do have this in the budget. So I just wanted you to, so if you did see that we were advertising for a middle school math position, we do have the position in the budget. So, you know, just letting you know. Thanks very much, Dorothy. I have a question I probably can't answer tonight, but I'd really like to know how many staff, not teachers amongst, I, I don't need names. I'm just wondering how many staff amongst our six schools who are not teachers, and so we don't have to vote on them, have decided not to go back to school to teach because they're older, they're afraid. I don't know the reasons, but I have a feeling there were quite a number of older people who, who decided not to continue or maybe others. And I just wonder how many of those people left and we have filled the spaces, but because we don't have to vote on them, we don't know that much about it. But I, I'm just curious about the number roughly. Yeah. Sometime in the future, you don't know tonight, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and that's a big question, Dorothy. Great question. Uh, and sometimes we might not know because uh, until the school year opens, and because right now people are sending in emails and requests and asking lots of questions, but uh, we haven't gotten any uh, outside of the folks that have submitted leave requests that, that the board just approved. We haven't been getting too many. Uh, too many, too many folks reaching out to us on that that piece. But what I can do is, uh, I can definitely reach out with Carla and see what Carla knows, and we might be able to reach back out to you. Great, thanks, Dorothy. Thank you, Brian. Okay, um, at this point, we're at this. As I was mentioning, we're at the second phase public comments, end of meeting um, segment. Um, it's 737. Um, I'm, I'm torn. Should we take a break before the public comments or should we? No, I'm seeing shaking heads. Okay, let's plow forth. Um, the floor is open for public comments. Um, Stephen, Dellinger Pate. Yes. So um, actually just kind of following off of your personnel moment and just I wanted to make sure that the board was aware that U32 has a new administrator in our uh, special education coordinator position. She's been lurking in all of these meetings, but I just wanna make sure that we're, um, that you're aware that Julia Pritchard has joined our team um, and, uh, and she is a definitely a great addition to it. And so um, she might be hiding on another screen depending on how many people you have on one, but she is a great addition to our team and we're certainly happy to have her in our special ed coordinator position. So just, just FYI, and, and uh, just want to welcome her aboard so the board knows who she is. Thank you, Stephen, and, and welcome, Julia. Um, I, I do see that you're there, even though I don't actually see you, but um, we're very happy to have you. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here. Great, great. Um, so uh, I, I see a hand raised from David Lawrence. Dave? Hi, uh, this was just going to be the quick comment that I had a uh, couple quick questions during the previous meeting. Um, but before I say that, I'd also meant to say I very much appreciate that, you know, right now we're basically being all asked, you know, what's your favorite flavor of poop sandwich? So um, I appreciate how hard this has been for you to all, you know, do the best you can to set the school up the best you can for everybody. It doesn't seem like there's any really good answers here. Um, and so I had meant to convey that in the previous meeting, and I'm sorry that I didn't, uh, that I skipped over that and headed right into my questions. Um, the uh, three questions are all really closely related, um, and as I said, pretty quick, I think, in that um, it's about remote learning. I looked on the, like, the FAQs for the, and it covers in, you know, very good detail all the in-person stuff, but I don't see any kind of link to, you know, what's the expectation for remote learning and how that's scheduled. I'm sure there's a document about it. It would just be really useful if it were linked on the web um, to the FAQs. 
uh, a related question I had to that actually did get covered in the meeting, which was going to be about, um, and so now this is a suggestion to update the web page a little in that it, um, there's a question about asking if a family feels like they have to keep their child home from school, um, you know, from their own caution, um, what, how does that add up? And, and the answer basically says, well, it's still going to be an absence. And that's fair enough, but it didn't really touch on at all whether, um, as, the, as the answer in the community forum did, uh, whether in fact it would not be an absence if they were able to participate in remote learning during that time. Um, kind of the, the implication was it's just going to be counted against you without like any remedy for that other than, well, you'd have to send your kids to school. And so I think that should be kind of clarified a little if remote learning is an option or why it's not, um, you know, how that plays into it. And then my last question was for Brian, just, um, you know, he went over again the step one, step two, step three, and the possibility that we might move to step three pretty quickly, which was full in-person school opening. And the one the significant question that I have about that is, okay, what does that mean for the 78 kids who are remote learning? Does that mean that they have to immediately swap to going back to in-person yeah. school? Is remote learning continued for the semester? How, how does that affect the remote learners if we go to step three? Yeah, I, I, and uh, I, that's a great question. Uh, I There were some other folks who did ask that question last week uh, with regards to, uh, and, he, and, I, and the secretary said, well, just because we go into step three, uh, if, in that, if and when they do make that decision, uh, they're going to be looking at uh, those remote, the schools that are doing remote learning and, you know, is there a way to, you know, is there, if, if, do we have to keep it the whole rest of the year? Do we have to start thinking about letting parents know, hey, uh, it's really that safe to come back? Uh, so I, that's, a, that's a thing that I'm meeting with the secretary on, my, on Thursdays, tomorrow is a Thursday. So, uh, you know, again, I'll be bringing that, I'll be raising that question up myself, but he did say that uh, that's a conversation that he's having with his planning team at the state level. Um, so, because he said that if you're doing these remote planning, you know, they might be, they, are they going to be keeping it for the rest of the year or for several months or a phase out? They, they, they have not gotten that detailed with it, uh, nor have they uh, uh, told us that piece, that question that you had. But it's a great question. It's something that I'm definitely following uh, with the state and I'll be asking it again tomorrow. So. Uh, and then one thing related to all that was just also it's it, it may have been said somewhere and I perhaps have glossed over it and so I apologize if this is something that has been addressed. Um, I'm, are teachers, is there going to be some dedicated remote learning teachers or are like in class teachers going to be splitting their time with also having to handle remote kids? Yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, do we have six teachers that have been identified to do remote learning at the different grade levels? Uh, and we are also now looking to see the possibility of offering some allied arts as well uh, for uh, some of the remote classrooms. Again, uh, it, we're, you know, we're uh, making peace. We don't want to, uh, uh, we're offering these opportunities for our children uh, in, re in the remote learning as well. So right now we have identified six teachers. It's in, it's, I know it's in the board packet. It might be, that might be posted online, but if, uh, if you need more information, just let me know. Great, thank you. You're welcome. I think Chris has just raised his hand, Chris McVeigh, and then Jonas. So, so, so based on what I've read and heard um, in terms of um, the agency of education and the governor giving over to the local schools how uh, to open up, um, that we would have the authority to keep remote learning all year if we chose to. Is that true? Uh, that, from what I understand, uh, he has not com uh, committed that to an exact guidance uh, with step three. And so he did mention the possibility, uh, but uh, I haven't heard anything uh, in writing. And uh, I, I know we're told things, you know, one month and then you see the guidance two months later or three weeks later, or it doesn't come at all. And uh, I, I see Stephen looking at me, laughing at me because, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he, he first told me that uh, that was an experience uh, I'll have to get used to. But uh, we're definitely, uh, you know, we're definitely going to be monitoring it. Uh, I, I think it's going to be interruptive to have, uh, to have, you know, if you have a remote system set up to go back. But uh, it really, there's going to be a lot of intangibles that, I don't think they've even accounted for yet uh, with the uh, medical, with the vac whether when the vaccine is coming, if a vaccine is coming, 
uh, how this is going to play out in the next few weeks, just in Vermont alone. Yeah, um, got that, Chris? Yeah, thank you. Okay, Jonas? Uh, so Dave, I just wanted to point out uh, at the Safe Learning site, safelearning.u32.org, uh, if you go up to the upper right in the WCUUSD information dropdown, the first uh, option there, uh, the first item there is the elementary remote learning option um, link that has the, um, the the Word document that I think was circulated a couple of weeks ago. It doesn't have all the updated information like who the teachers are going to be for the remote uh, for those remote classrooms, but there is a bunch of information there, including a sample schedule. Um, and I know that at least one of the schools, uh, one of the principals, sent out the teachers who are going to be. Um, uh, teaching the remote classes and those names are also in the board packet which you could also find at the district website great thank you so much um it just be useful to link that from the faq too yeah thank you Jonas.